Hello and welcome to the Year Ahead Conference 2022, sponsored by Civica and the Credit Services Association. I'm Yvonne Favag, Labour MP for Makerfield in Wigan uh, since 2010. And prior to that, I was Chief Executive of St Helens Citizens Advice Bureau for 23 years. So I've had a long association with both trading standards and environmental health. So I'm really pleased to be here in the second year of the partnership event that's being delivered online. And the CTSI are delighted this year to be working with the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health and the Institute of Licensing to bring this event to you. We've got a really exciting lineup of speakers for today's session, and I've just got a few housekeeping rules before we get started. There will be time at the end of each session for some questions, so please put them in the Q&A section and we'll try to get through as many of these as possible. We'll also have some polls running in the background throughout and really welcome your feedback into these. But as we start, I'm delighted to introduce the speaker for our welcome address, and that's Janet Russell OBE, who is Vice President of the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health. So over to Janet now, please. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, I'm very jerky. It's not your computers at home. Um, and my internet's not very good at the moment, but I have a slide set. So hopefully me jerking, uh, being very dodgy at the bottom won't um, distract you too much. I'll switch off my camera while the presentation's on. Um, so when I was starting uh, to think about what to say as an introduction, I was thinking, well, you know, great, a year ahead conference. Last year, we were looking forward to um, probably coming out of COVID completely, getting back to normal. Um, but sadly, normal doesn't seem to appear. It feels rather like one of those emergency planning exercises several of us have done over our lives, where each time you think you're getting on top of something, something else comes and, and knocks you along. Um, so um, I can't move the slides along either. So could some, ah, no, it's, it's done it. Um, so this year, it's the cost of living crisis that's um, made um, a difference to us. Um, and that will manifest itself in several different ways. But just what I want to concentrate in setting the scene for the next two days is um, the impacts on individuals, the impacts on businesses and the impacts on services. Um, but at the same time as we're dealing with those uh, cost of living issues, um, we've also got lots of other things coming from the sidelines. We've got the workforce challenges of how do we maintain um, an adequate and funded workforce. Um, and that's both in, in public sector and private sector. We've got new regulation. And there I would say, um, is it less or is it more? or more likely is it going to be more with less. We've got other big policy issues, tackling climate change, inequalities in health, they're not going away and um, all our um, workforce will have um, involvement in those. And also we're going into a two year period where, um, uh, who knows, because crystal balls don't appear to be there in terms of, of, of kind of politics at the moment, but um, we could be preparing for a change of government and that will have implications for us as well. So um, some of these issues are going to be covered later in the programme, so I'm not going to dwell too long on them. Um, but on workforce challenges, I know it's a real issue uh, in the public sector. Um, our regulatory services, of course, were, were kind of... Um, in the fore during COVID um, across all, all three um, professional bodies who are represented here today. Um, I will just mention, um, Bayes has produced a document, Building Workforces Fit for the Future, and I'll put the link for that uh, in the handouts. I'll send it so that there's a link because it, it's a bit difficult to find. But that has examples uh, from various local authorities as to how they're dealing with the issue of, of 
um, maintaining, maintaining an adequate workforce, but also uh, training. So, for example, the North East Public Protection Partnership have put all their um, financial uh, information in as to how they're dealing with uh, getting new people into the workforce. Bradford um, is another example where they're actually um, using apprentices because um, they're in an area where market force premiums are drawing um, uh, staff away from from their authority. So, um, so as I say, I'll put that in. Um, there is a real role for the professional bodies here in being guardians of professional standards and supporting educational establishments in um, developing and maintaining courses so that we've got a continued flow of people coming into the profession. Um, the other issue is, of course, how to make our professions attractive uh, against all the competition. So um, if we look at one of the other challenges we're facing, and again, some of these will be covered later in the programme. Oops, skip to slide. Um, so new regulation and perhaps kind of the biggest one um, that kind of uh, will have impact is um, the retained EU legislation reform bill. Um, and um, again, there's a session on that, so I won't dwell too long, but just to say um, uh, with that bill, um, there's 2,400 plus pieces of legislation. If the government really feels that it can do an adequate job on it um, by the end of next year, it really is living in cloud cuckoo land. So the great worry is that um, all better regulation principles will go out of the window um, and um, there won't be adequate consultation or indeed adequate um, time to see that new proposals fit with existing proposals. Um, and um, having looked at the responses that are already in on, the, on this bill, um, it's uniformly been um, asked by business and regulators to not go for the sunsetting clauses at the end of next year. Um, and that's understandable because businesses need absolute certainty. They can't have everything thrown up in the air and, and, and dropped in a random form. And um, regulators equally um, need to be able to advise businesses with confidence um, about any new legislation. And if government needs to see the need for that, they just need to look back 12 months to COVID when local authority staff were at the forefront of assisting businesses in complying with COVID regulations that um, many businesses didn't have the time um, to be able to get to grips with uh, by reading online documents. Um, it, it, it really is um, an issue and I think this is one where and I've noticed that um, our professional bodies have joined together with others where there needs to be a united from because it doesn't really matter what the regulation is that's been looked at it's the principles that lie behind it that are, are really important um, alongside this of course we've still got the the border issues and again there's papers later on on this but um, again for colleagues in Northern Ireland this is going to have specific um, uh, issues where they're going to have to work uh, fairly hard with uh, um, what whatever government there is in Northern Ireland, uh, uh, as well as as kind of UK wide, and all those who are port health authorities are suddenly going to have quite um, a large uh, burden uh, of checks um, and balances to look at. Um, and then the other one that I just wanted to touch on was housing and renters reform. Um, of course, the way that um, the economy will affect individuals is it is pushing more people into poverty. Um, and as they do that, they're increasingly at prey from scammers, those who um, want to take advantage. 
um, and housing is going to be um, a particularly um, difficult area. Um, it could be that um, any renters reform could actually uh, have the impact of reducing uh, the number of rented properties available and the housing stock as, as landlords, uh, as some landlords retreat from um, housing. Um, but also, um, uh, of course, housing uh, legislation um, is also under review and, and particularly the housing standards, um, which we understand is under review. Um, and we have cases like we did with, with damp mould, where um, it is really, really important that all housing providers, including housing associations and public sector advisors, uh, uh, public sector providers, really understand that um, an unacceptable health hazard um, fails category one um, of decent homes. Um, and therefore, it is totally unacceptable. And Michael Gove writing out to local authorities is fine, but we really need the staff to be able to enforce these regulations. Um, BRE have estimated that it costs the NHS £1.4 billion a year um, treating people who live in houses where there are Category 1 failures. So um, it's the age-old thing of public health. If only government would wake up to the fact that there are savings down the line, early investment would pay dividends. Alongside the regulation, though, um, I know our staff are deeply involved in, in um, policy issues that don't always fit into the regulatory box. Um, and this includes things like climate change and health inequalities, which are probably two of the most important policy issues, uh, both facing the country and the world. Um, health inequality is likely to get more unequal. Um, climate change, um, you know, we're involved in um, dabbling sometimes in it rather than um, actually going for um, a full blown um, intervention here. Um, and I would just mention here perhaps uh, one example that I don't think we're covering further on, but came out this week, which was the announcement about Eco Plus, which is due to start in April next year um, for insulating homes. And um, on one level, good news, it looks like it's £1 billion of new money, although sometimes it's quite difficult to find out. Um, it's good that... Um, the government is doing something about it because I think the Liz Trust government was absolutely not going to do anything about insulation. So I suppose um, we take a positive for that. Um, but it's looking like households will only get 80% of the costs of their insulation measures. And for me, the big question is, if you're talking about people who are living in um, probably um, A and B council tax bands where their um, uh, EPC levels D or lower, where are they going to find the extra 20% from? And I would suggest that perhaps local authorities aren't going to be the place where um, there's going to be lots of money sloshing around to pay for that. So um, some real questions there. Um, it could well exclude private rent rented sector because that's covered by MEES. Um, and the, it still leads us to the same issue, which is where are the properties that need uh, treating? And it is probably local authorities who are best placed to actually find those properties. Um, and therefore, if there were resources available to local authorities, there could be a much more efficient and targeted programme. But again, um, looking at a figure of one billion, which sounds great, um, Assuming that probably, and this is a big assumption, that each property is um, probably £5,000 plus, um, then in actual fact that's 200,000 properties, which is way, way, way below the number that need insulating. So um, a, a small start, but could do better, I think. And then finally, um, I just want to mention um, preparing for a change um, 
in government because now is the time uh, when professional bodies um, can start getting under the skin of, of, of political parties and civil servants um, in terms of helping to inform and shape their policies going forward. Um, and um, I think there is real uh, scope here, but capacity could well be an issue. Um, and because of the devolved nature of our regulations, um, it's really, really important that the professional bodies understand the, um, the nuances uh, of operating in, in Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, and, and if it's covered Scotland as well, because um, a lot of our regulation is actually devolved. So uh, it's really important that that's done. Um, so my kind of final thing would be to urge professional bodies to step up to the plate and instead of just sending out um, information to government, make those contacts with people who really understand how um, different areas of policy work in the field and that's both in business and in, in public sector. So finally, uh, before I finish, I would just like, uh, from my perspective, to say a big thank you um, to Phil in CTSI uh, and Gary and Kate in CIEH, because um, uh, and it, it does relate to the preparing for change. Um, I was kind of uh, fortunate or unfortunate enough to work for the Department of Health during COVID. Um, and without the three of them and lots of you who are working in local governments, we would never have got to the place where we're actually um, um, make it made an impact on uh, responding to COVID. Um, it really was a big effort by everyone. So, as I say, thank you particularly to the three who are in policy and the professional bodies and to all of you in the field. Um, you did a great job over a year and I don't think you've been thanked enough for it. So, enjoy the conference and uh, people who know more about things than me will will follow on well thank you very much janet and i'm pleased to hear that you're looking at influencing policy in the future it's something that the three all party groups which i chair are focusing on i chair the all party groups on electrical home safety debt and personal finance and consumer protection and it's obvious to see the links between all of them we now move to our first session, which is what does the future for regulation look like? And it's going to look at the changes in the future of regulation, considering the effect of the EU retained law bill. Are we moving to risk based or outcomes based regulation? And what will that mean for the regulatory services? And finally, what are the public attitudes to regulation? We hear a lot about red tape. A lot of that red tape is actually public protection. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, who's Professor Christopher Hodges of the Emeritus Professor of Justice Systems at Oxford University. Over to you, uh, Christopher. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, I'm uh, academically uh, and consultancy wise, I've been involved in regulation for many, many years. I now chair the Regulatory Horizons Council, which advises government on innovative regulation and how to, how to regulate it. And I'll say a word about that later on, wearing my official hat. But what I'm going to talk about to start off with um, it, it are my own thoughts on where we are in regulation at the moment. Um, if we could have the, the slides, please. Um, I believe that there is a um, a point at the moment at which we are um, looking at quite a big change, <laughs> even the famous famous idea of a big paradigm change in regulation. The UK has been working on um, regulation and at the forefront of better regulation globally for a very long time. There are quite a few points here, which I think all add up to the fact that something really quite significant is currently happening or about to happen. Um, as far as research is concerned, there is a great deal body of evidence now, uh, 30, 40 years perhaps, on how regulators work in different sectors, regulators and enforcers in the broadest sense. Um, 
So people have looked at what works and what doesn't work. And there's a great deal of evidence. A lot of it is in silos. So you've got to look in food or environmental or nuclear or health and safety or whatever it is. But if you actually are able to see the overview, it's starting to build up to a very significant and consistent picture. The difficult point is that this challenges traditional ideas of how we regulate and in particular how we enforce so there are some perhaps surprising i say atypical approaches here about what aviation safety for example calls performance-based regulation in which they almost remove blame in order to get everyone to cooperate planes only stay in the sky and let's remember just how successful they are in doing that we all have confidence and trust in getting on a plane that we will get off at the other end um, and it's quite remarkable when you consider the complexities, uh, technical complexities and the number of people involved in all this. But the reason is it boils down to what they call an open and just culture. Now, an open culture, they share all information all the time on the basis of trust. And a just culture is that there are always consequences when something is identified that's a problem. But it's not necessarily what we would call enforcement traditionally. In fact, the CAA very rarely uses fines or it frequently talks to people and may lean on them and occasionally removes a license. But it's a different approach. So we changed the language and we've changed the mode in order to achieve this stunning outcome. There's now a very considerable body. Oh, my slides are doing some strange things. There's now a very considerable body of academic research into the science of how people behave. Organizations involve human behavior. Regulation involves human behavior. So I speak as a lawyer, having been trained in legal theory, legal philosophy, and having learned quite a lot about economic theory, which includes deterrence, rational acting, individual responsibility, and concepts like that. But actually, where we need to start is with the science of how people behave. In other words, behavioral psychology, and social psychology and organizational and cultural factors. And they point in a different direction. And it, it is those factors which support things like aviation safety. Now, there was a big change following the Hampton report in 2005, of course, with the beginnings of better regulation. Although it's slightly run out of steam around the world, the UK was at the head of this, but pressure from industry is now building up to say, can't we get back to this? Can't we work together? Can't we be more supportive and collaborative? And I hear it from quite a few different business sectors. What is emerging in a whole sequence of policy papers in the past year or so um, is, is a new buzz, new buzz word, because we've talked about better regulation, smart regulation, agile regulation, and we're now talking about outcome-based regulation. There are quite a few policy papers globally from the OECD, but you can find it in recent papers by the Financial <laughs> and the many others here. In fact, yesterday, I note that um, the winners of the Regulators Pioneer Fund were announced, which includes one or two um, local authorities, which is splendid for local projects. But the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency got the second largest award of nearly a million for outcome based regulation, a study on that. And they'd be doing some very interesting things uh, up there for a while. On the public sector side, um, one sees the need for more cooperation, for example, between local authorities and health and social care aspects of the of the NHS all working together. And in fact, that was just being referred to. Um, there was a recent report there talking about cooperation. Now, if you put outcome based regulation and cooperation together, you get um, what I've called because I've been researching all this throughout uh, lockdown and, and longer and reading massive amounts of behavioral psychology. You get a model called outcome based cooperative regulation, and that is now being successfully used in a number of contexts. The key point here, perhaps conceptually, is that the legal model of regulation about making rules, inspecting and identified breaches, imposing sanctions, but then assuming 
that sanctions will deter and achieve compliance is usually not particularly reliable. Um, of course, you need to make rules. Of course, you need to inspect and identify breaches, or someone does. Um, but maybe one can do this better on a collaborative approach and with IT approaches. And of course, there need, as I said in the civil aviation example, to be consequences. But is it sanctions in the traditional enforcement approach? Well, of course it is if you are protecting society from criminals and all the rest of it. But if one's dealing with businesses where one needs to improve their performance, then different approaches work. So it becomes more complex. One needs more tools in the box. The simple idea, therefore, behind outcome-based cooperative regulation is that humans always achieve more when we cooperate. So how do we do that? And the basis of the model, which is in this book on the right-hand side, which is quite, quite a large book because it's got a lot of science in it, um, is that we need to work out what it is we're trying to do. In other words, agree all the purposes and the outcomes. Uh, are we producing harm or are we producing good outcomes? Let's measure that. Usually, regulators and enforcers measure outputs. In other words, numbers of inspections, guidance documents produced, fines imposed, prosecutions, etc. Those aren't outcomes. As one American chief of police said, you can have millions of fines. Does that make the streets safe? No. We've then got to work together. And how do we do that? Well, it's inherent in our species, Homo sapiens, and it's hardwired into our brains. We work on the basis of trust. So let's produce evidence of trustworthiness, which is then assessed against our inherent um, understanding of what is right, what is right and wrong. And again, Homo sapiens is, is appears to be the only species that actually understands the difference between right and wrong. Uh, and that's how we know who we can trust and who we can't. So let's work on this and produce more evidence that we can be trusted. Now, there's a great deal more that could be said here on this model, including discussions which are going on at the moment at very high level in Whitehall about potentially implementing this approach. Um, I, I should say that I'm, I'm involved in some very interesting discussions involving the property and housing sector and um, supporting small businesses within which local and regional approaches and local authorities are absolutely key. So this, this may be top down, but um, the local engaged element involving what local authorities do is absolutely critical, I think, and can be taken a stage further. Let me just um, finish my a bit by talking with my official hat on about the Regulatory Horizons Council, because this is an example of how things are changing. The government's report on um, the technology in the fourth industrial revolution um, three years ago said we need to look at this very carefully. So we now have an Office for Science and Technology Strategy headed by the government's chief scientist, Sir Patrick Vallance. We now have a Regulatory Horizons Council, which is an independent body uh, mainly of professors of science, to identify the implications of technological in innovation and advise government on regulatory reform needed to support its rapid and safe introduction. And I'm lucky enough to recently be the second chair of the RHC. We traditionally work on uh, looking at important technologies and have produced two tranches of reports on genetic technologies, fusion energy, drones, and medical devices. Actually, yesterday, uh, al along with the package, including the Regulators uh, Pioneer Fund, um, we produced reports on AIs, medical devices, neurotechnology. There will be one soon on hydrogen propulsion in maritime. And we produced an overview saying closing the gap. How do we close the gap between innovation and getting this stuff into use? There's much more that could be said here. Um, so this is just a general general approach. These are the key points in the in the closing the gap report about proportionality and embracing ethics and public engagement, taking account of commercial considerations and the need to attract investment, looking at alternative forms of regulation, getting the timing right. Uh, in other words, sometimes you don't need to regulate new technology um, and a culture of openness, mindset and growth. So a lot of the words, a lot of the language, a lot of the concepts, a lot of the ways we work, I think, are changing quite considerably. 
Um, it's not just with high tech innovative stuff. I believe that this actually is coming to streets near you now. And it's immensely exciting because the basic point is it improves how we operate. And it improves the outcomes that we get either as regulators or in terms of helping business do better. And of course, that's what we need as a country just at the moment. So that's my uh, brief, very quick contribution. And I look forward to joining you later. Well, thank you very much, Professor Hodges. I think with no further ado, we'll move to Gareth Snell, who's Head of Political Engagement at Unchecked. But just a quick reminder, please put any questions into the Q&A box and I'll, we'll deal with those after. Hello. Uh, well, first of all, good morning. And I bring greetings from the whole Unchecked team to your conference. Um, uh, thank you very much for having us. Um, so, as Yvonne said, my name is Gareth Snell. I'm the uh, head of political engagement work I do with Unchecked UK, and we are a not-for-profit organisation that have been around for about three years, trying to make the case for uh, common sense, better regulations, and stronger regulations. But also, we work with a variety of organisations on how they can better talk about regulations in a way that doesn't buy into the stereotype stereotypes of red tape and burdens. Um, we are a supporter organisation, so we have uh, supporters, including your host and sponsor this evening, the CTSI and the uh, Charter Institute of Environmental Health, but all the way through to organisations like the Women's Institute. Um, and primarily, we have been doing work over the last 18 months on the public attitudes towards regulations, uh, and in particular, in the run up to the rule bill, we're working with other organisations to see where we can help construct the narrative that regulations are a force for good and when uh, applied properly and enforced properly, create the level playing field that allows us to thrive, allows business to grow and keeps the public safe. So I just want to run through some of our top line figures uh, this morning. I don't have a set of slides, but I will make sure that what I say gets circulated after the uh, conference this morning. So um, Un Unchecked has been looking at what public think about the um, uh, regulation since about 2020. So the organisation has been using both our own qualitative and quantitative research through polls, through public forums, through uh, focus groups on a variety of issues, as well as harvesting the work that's being done by other organisations. So the, the top line figure that we start with is that in 2018, when the IPPR was looking at this, post-Brexit, when there was lots of consideration and discussion about what the UK would look like after we'd left the European Union, the IPPR found that on pretty much all of the regulations that people could name, so things like the Working Time Directive and things around vehicle fuel emissions, temporary agency workers, etc., that you know, more than half of the public were in favour of not only retaining those, rule, those regulations, but also strengthening them. In 2020, Unchecked specifically started working with and talking to a group of uh, young Leave voters. So these were people under the age of 48 who had voted Leave in the referendum specifically to gain an insight into what they were thinking about regulations. Um, we asked a group of young Leave voters what they thought were the most important issues facing the UK today. And we gave them the option of the amount and nature of regulation in the UK and of the uh, 17 various options, the amount of regulation came third from bottom as being one of the big important issues. Um, we, it was not surprising that we found that more common uh, concerns around, the, around crime, around the environment and around uh, health were the dominant features of this. And there were few who were sort of jumping up and down demanding fewer regulations. Um, in particular, when we asked the same group of young Leave voters what they felt, whether there was too much, not enough regulation, or whether they thought the level of regulation was just right in a variety of different areas, from immigration and asylum, through to the environmental regulations, through to uh, pension services and driving regulations and health and safety, on all of the areas and metrics which we polled, we, we had uh, more than 60% of uh, respondents say that there was either more regulation needed or the level of regulation was enough. There was no particular clamour among young Leave voters 
to reduce or weaken the levels of regulation that we have in the UK. And so we drilled down a little bit further because obviously we recognise that, you know, that the people who voted to leave the EU in 2016 were a mixture of all different political parties and persuasions and their motivations were very different. So we specifically then started speaking to young leave conservative voters. And again, we asked them whether they would like to, uh, what, what they thought about regulation levels on certain sectors and whether there was a appetite for increasing, sustaining or reducing those targets and uh, again the results were they were quite surprising in that you know 84% of young leave voting conservative voters wanted to see an increase or a at least a sustaining of the existing levels when it comes to food safety when it came to consumer protection laws it was 80% of respondents when we talked about the use of chemicals 74% wanted to see either stronger better enforced regulations or the level of regulation staying the same. There was no clamour, there was no public attitude, there was no hunger among people here who were Leave voters and Conservative voters to reduce regulation to, to weaken those standards. Um, and we also, uh, we, we, took, we, we took comfort from that in the sense that the, the people the government proclaimed to be trying to talk to were not saying what the government were trying to articulate that they were saying. So we took we took the chance then to look at um, what we looked at some geographical areas. So we specifically in the run up to the 2021 Senate um, and local elections in Wales, we took some work and we looked at what was happening with Welsh voters uh, approaches. And this was again across across the political spectrum. And it was also in areas that had a uh, a very strong support for leaving the European Union and again things like protection for the wildlife we got 80% of the respondents saying that they should be strengthened or kept the same that food standards and cleanliness standards should be kept the same or strengthened that was in the mid 80s uh, we didn't get any any of the any of the areas in which we polled for uh, across Wales came in with uh, lower than 70% of respondents and, and these were statistically weighted uh, properly composed uh, polling panels and focus groups saying that they wanted to see stronger regulations or at the very least maintaining the current levels of regulations. Indeed, only 4% of Welsh voters came back and said they would like to see lower standards than those that we have in the EU, which we, I, you know, unchecked, we take as a, uh, as a great comfort that the deregulation agenda that we know is being pursued by or was being pursued by certain elements of the Conservative Party and in government are no longer is not something that the public actually wants and in particular the base of the Conservative Party doesn't want and, and we are doing our best at the moment to work with our supporters and organisers uh, organisations to get the right messaging framework to convey that to Conservative MPs and to government um, uh, advisors and to those people that have roots into government to say that this just simply isn't popular. Um, in May 2022, we also uh, undertook some work in the Blue Wall, you know, the, the the series of marginal conservative seats, mainly in the southeast and the southwest, that are um, likely or potentially going to change hands at the general election, either because of um, uh, to the Labour or to the Liberal Democrats. And, and again, we found that even when we were polling conservative voters in the Blue Wall seats, uh, less than half, less than a third of the voters in those seats thought that the UK had too much regulation by um, quite a clear margin. Uh, voters there thought that the UK had just about the right amount or needed stronger, more regulation. Um, and overall, when you, when you of the total electoral um, group in that seat, there was, you know, we were talking sort of in the 70% again of, of, of voters who thought that there was just enough or, or about or, or more regulation was required. Um, again, when we broke that down into leave and to remain voters in those seats, we found that 75% of remain voters, but also 73% of leave voters thought that, you know, we should be looking to strengthen regulations when it comes to the environment. And, you know, when it comes to trade deals, we should be putting British standards above economic growth. You know, there was a clear and consistent message coming across the entirety of uh, the population that we were polling. Um, we also undertook some 
video uh we got we got people in what was considered to be the red wall so post-industrial seats in the, the midlands and the north of england um around the online safety bill asking uh respondents to tell us what they thought about regulating the internet and what they thought about um protections online and again even people who again would be considered to be the base of the conservative party were coming forward and telling us that they believe that there ought to be strong regulation to protect them and to protect their children and organically they were also spreading out into other areas so they talked about the environment they talked about you know being at the health and safety at work they talked about things that that we know are important to people across the country but they were doing that organically and they were not buying into the um deregulated agenda of the government and then and then finally um in october 2022 we did some snap polling following the announcements from uh, the former chancellor and the former prime minister of their budget around deregulation and for business and again we got 74 percent of people who responded to our snap poll again done with a reputable polling company through statistically weighted models to tell us and they told us that they they, they the regulations in the uk were either just about right or were needed to be strengthened to protect the things that we care about um only 26 percent of those that actually came back said that it was important to reduce regulation because they, they thought it was a burden and, and again this was this was at the heart of um the government's plan and then when we asked people about environmental regulations we found that those numbers jump even further towards the 80 percent mark where people were saying that you know we just need to be better at this we need to be stronger regulations we need to be doing this so and we did those in conjunction with the RFPB, the Wildlife Trust and the Woodland Trust, because, you know, we, we're working with partners to sort of make sure that we're all speaking the same language. So in terms of answer the question of what's the future like for regulations, I mean, Un Unchecked is doing a piece of work on the law bill. We're going to be in Parliament on the 13th of December, trying to sign up parliamentarians and peers to pledge to protect protections. We are getting uh, good buy-in on that from a cross-party basis. We are, uh, and we believe that if the, with a bit of coordination, there are there is a real appetite to defend the regulations that you know so many of the organisations that we work with depend on, but also that we know the public are in favour of. Um, and, and crucially, and I think this is something that we will be looking at taking forward. Um, some of the organisations that we work with that traditionally haven't talked about regulations are not. And are not necessarily in the sphere realize that this is a an important part of protecting civic work and so are now wanting to be active and engaged and start speaking of that so we're doing a lot of work with the wi which you know an organization that is not necessarily um at its core there to protect regulations but they know for their membership base the, the, this is an issue as well because they're hearing it so we are so to answer the question we believe that the future for regulation is bright we've just got to fight for it and organize for it and I'll leave it there. Right, well, thank you very much, Gareth. Uh, I can move now to Charles Nankari, who's Director of Regulation at the National Audit Office, but I believe he's having some problems with his internet, so it may drop out, but there is a poll if anyone wants to join in with that as well. So if I can move now to Charles, thank you. I think there may be some problems here. No. Yeah, we've moved to the poll now. I think Charles is trying to dial in. Yeah, I think we could address the first question now, and it's from Timothy Crute. And it's, is the smoke-free regulation a good example where cooperation and public perception of modifying their behaviour has won the argument 
rather than the fines. And I think that's probably directed, Chris, at you, if you'd like to answer that one. Quite possibly. And one thinks also of um, social changes like um, uh, wearing seatbelts or, or, or other social change in how we talk to each other. Um, th th these are complex issues. And what I now believe as a lawyer is that actually behaviour based on ethical codes and our understanding of that is at least as important as law. Um, and law is almost overrated. It is essential um, because we need to have a formal way of saying if you do something um, which society says is absolutely wrong, then that needs to have a, a boundary and stepping the other side of it needs to be marked. Um, and I can see a, a, a subsequent question saying, sh are we removing all the all the protections, all the rest of it? Absolutely not. Um, the whole purpose of regulation um, in the broadest sense is to protect, protect society. It is difficult, which is why you've actually got to sit down in the first line on my on my slide, which has these various layers, because one has to um, have discussions about balancing different purposes and different freedoms. In other words, you've got protection on one hand and you've got personal freedom or business ability to innovate and make profit and all the rest of it on the other hand. But actually having conversations about what are we doing in what sequence seems to be the best thing to do. So I've slightly gone off the question there, but I hope that's helpful background. But the, the interrelation, the, the, the Lord just saying we're not going to do this we're going to ban smoking we're going to ban not wearing seat belts we're going to ban going through red lights doesn't necessarily itself lead to changes in behavior and there's plenty of evidence on that i'm just reading a book written by a u.s submarine captain who completely changed the behavior of his crew um, by talking and pushing uh, authority down to them and getting them involved and almost, I wouldn't say throw away the rule book, but creating a different sort of rule book. Well, thank you very much for that. I believe we do have Charles back now. So I think before his internet goes again, we probably need to move on to him. So thanks, Charles. No, it's gone again. Uh, problems of online conference. I think we'll probably move then to the next question when I can negotiate the tech as well. Um, so it's from Adrian Allman and he talks about fixed penalty notices and he says, are they the best form of regulation for local authorities to use for food safety, food standards and health and safety matters? And does that encourage behaviour change? And again, I'm afraid, Chris, I think that's one for you again. And I, I think Gareth wants to come in on that too. Um, should we move to Gareth first then, if you wanted to come in, Gareth? Yeah, thanks. Well, I mean, I was I mean, in a former life, I was a council leader with the responsibilities that came with a tier two authority. And, and, and we found that um, fines didn't necessarily work always because they looked combative and people would consider us to be overly officious. Um, we found in the authority that I used to lead that actually um, public, when, if there was a if there was a if there was a reputational issue with an institution, they they, they changed it very quickly because there was a there was a, a a reputational damage to them. And so, if there was a poor food rating, then suddenly the newspapers would have their usual splash once a quarter of all the places that have got a low food rating. And then all of a sudden, you'd find that they've improved them. Um, but in terms of changing public attitude, one of the things that we've asked unchecked is around. We, we've asked we've asked the public and we've asked who we're going to what what they think they can do and one of the things that we've been very surprised about is the number of individuals that believe they have a lack of agency who um when you say to them you know, they believe something should be done and they believe someone should do it but they just don't believe it is there not because they don't want to but because they simply don't believe they can influence those decisions so one of the pieces that we're looking at for the future is how we can help the public potentially um have more agency over the rules that govern them, but also the enforcement of those rules. Thank you very much, Gareth. I can see on the screen we've got uh, Charles Nankaro back. So I think before the internet drops again, we better move over to him. So thanks very much, Charles. 
Great, thank you. Uh, apologies, everybody. I've been running around the office trying to find a, a, a good enough speed. So hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, this works. Um, so I just um, wanted to spend a few minutes today uh, talking about uh, the work of the NEO uh, with regard to um, training centers and trust institutes of health and, and, and the work we've done over the years. Just very briefly, um, the uh, NEO um, is the uh, auditor of uh, central government. We're a parliamentary body, and um, as well as uh, doing the financial audit of um, all of uh, government's financial accounts, we do value for money work. Uh, uh, is um, deliver through local bodies. Um, I am uh, the director of regulation value for money, and um, so I've ever seen quite a few um, reports over the last few years, um, which have looked at local delivery, but in particular, the work of Chartered uh, Trading Standards Institute. Um, I uh, perhaps just talk about the value for money work that we do, um, as well as doing value for money reports, which are uh, taken by uh, a parliamentary committee called the Public Accounts. Uh, committee and um, uh, other uh, parliamentary bodies. Uh, we also do uh, good practice guides, which um, are, uh, you know, uh, really based on the sort of learning we've got from the reports we've done uh, and, and you know, webinars and other, other sort of um, uh, outputs that really try to look at the lessons we've learned from uh, our work and, um, you know, support good good quality delivery. I just want to say a few words about um, the consumer protection reports uh, that we've done. Uh, going all the way back, uh, the first time we really looked at this was in June 2011, actually. Um, and this was when uh, the OFT uh, was in existence. And I think we were looking at the work of um, consumer protection, the, the whole landscape. Really, we found quite a few issues at that stage, things like detriment not being understood or measured, uh, cross-border cases were at risk, um, you know, due to reduced funding, and at that stage, everything was done locally. Um, the OFT prioritization and allocation case uh, system wasn't really working as well as it could do. Um, and, you know, there were lots of recommendations in that report. Now, at that time, we were working quite closely with um, the business department, um, as well as um, CTSI and other bodies. Uh, there was there was a, a PAC um, parliamentary uh, evidence session on that after the report and um, the report itself and Parliament made quite a few recommendations and I think it was after that really that the Consumer Protection Partnership came into existence um, then obviously there was there was work on kind of um, local and uh, regional national trading standards and uh, you know a lot a lot of activity and subsequent to that in 2016 we also uh, followed up and looked at progress and and you know we noted there issues around um, you know whilst there had been lots of progress that the, the capability and capacity the funding and so on was was you know really quite still an issue so um, we've been in the space of looking at consumer protection in and fair trading um, in terms of trading standards for quite a while um, and have continued to do work. More recently, um, we've looked at other areas of government policy delivery where it's done locally. Um, so we um, did some work looking at uh, the Food Standards Agency. Uh, we looked at uh, the Office of Product Safety and Standards. We looked at uh, private renting and also gambling regulation. So what we've done probably over the last three, four, five years is look at uh, a lot of areas of central policy delivery where there's a, um, a significant kind of local element to it. Um, but we've taken this kind of, you know, as I guess as a central government auditor, we've kind of looked at the, uh, you know, central government way of delivering things, which is to look at the policy responsibilities. And um, because we hold departments to account, the accounting officer generally is the perm sec of a department or the chief exec of a um, a regulatory body, we've tended to look at it by policy area. So as I say, we've looked at um, product safety and standards, we've looked at uh, private renting, DLUC, we've looked at gambling um, commission and, and DCMS, food standards, um, uh, health, and, and uh, to a certain extent, DEFRA. What we haven't done is really uh, look at it from the other end of the delivery uh, telescope, if you like, and think about what does this mean for a local authority or, or what does it mean for a place-based um, democratic system as it were or delivery system so we haven't you know we've looked at uh, the kind of vertical way of uh, 
that, that, that policy is delivered. We haven't looked at it sort of horizontally uh, across local authorities. So what we're uh, wanting to do at the moment, uh, we've we've just started another piece of work, which is something called a lessons learned report. Um, so this isn't uh, like our normal VFM studies where we look at one area of policy delivery and, and, and look at the value for money. It's looking at um, our back catalogue of work, looking at all of the things that uh, you know we've learned from those reports going right back to 2011, and trying to bring them together and, and saying you know at, when we look at these different regulated areas, what what actually does that tell us about the the common challenges, uh, what you know best practice, uh, what works well, uh, but also how um, central government can really think a bit more coherently about. Uh, where it's delivering regulation locally. And so we're working with CTSI and um, Charter Institute of Environmental Health really to think about engaging local authorities in that piece of work and thinking about what, what does it mean from uh, your perspective as a place-based delivery uh, organization? You know, how, how um, what's the experience of delivering these different policies side by side? How does the prioritization work? And how could kind of central government better understand your world, you know, how could it understand um, where the prioritization takes place, how trade-offs uh, are made, um, what sort of support central government needs to give um, in delivering these different areas. I think I think what we found is that, you know, or the reason for doing this piece really is that, um, uh, you know, one can see from um, the perspective of a, of a local authority, uh, local delivery bodies that you're looking into central government and there's many many different uh, policy objectives sitting in different government departments and the sort of coherence of that uh, can be we think you know a bit a bit of a problem I mean that's certainly we've picked this up from all of these reports that we've done in the past um, uh, so we're looking at you know how, how the funding mechanism works we're interested in how the policy is articulated um, how well central government understands the kind of tools that are used locally um, and how well they kind of support support those objectives uh, and of course this will you know involve um, lots of central government departments including of course DLUC because um, of their uh, responsibilities around private renting but also their sort of more general stewardship responsibilities with regard to um, um, training standards and, and uh, um, the environmental health so that's really all I wanted to talk about was the sort of role that NAA is playing. Um, we are very actively engaged with with institutes, uh, with both um, institutes, uh, and we would really be interested in hearing from you uh, about uh, any thoughts you've got, um, or things we should be looking at, things you think uh, this report might recommend to central government, uh, you know, areas that we might uh, usefully actually look at. I mean, as I say, it's not a value for money study in the sense that we're going to be doing lots of uh, original analysis of a particular policy area. What we're doing is pulling together the learning that we've had to date, but also engaging with some, you know, representative or a cross section of, of local authorities to really understand uh, the, you know, delivery landscape from their perspective. And, and hopefully that will uh, be able to draw out some um, good practice, uh, some lessons learned for, for central governments, and um, you know, uh, give a good oversight of, of how um, regulatory delivery is working. So, so that was all I wanted to say, but obviously, hopefully, if the internet is uh, stable enough, very happy to sort of take questions on that. Well, thank you very much, Charles. I'm sorry we couldn't see you for a lot of that presentation, but uh, thank you for that. I think the audience now do have a few uh, questions. Um, and we've got one here from Ian Simpson, which says, outcome-based cooperative regulation sounds good but don't we need some care that this doesn't detract from traditional methods to, to tackle the counterfeiters, the scammers, the fraudsters, which is where a lot of the regulators spend their time. And there is quite a lot of concern about this. We've also got a question relating to this from Amanda Cool and Paul Lewis talking about scam and fraud. So I think, um, Chris, that probably is aimed at you in the regulatory horizons. Yes, I, it's not a regulatory horizon as such, it's me, <laughs> perhaps personally. Um, I absolutely agree. I said that regulation is about protection. Where you've got people who are breaking the rules of society set out in law, one needs to protect people. And, and you, you do not throw away all the tools in the toolbox. You probably actually expand the toolbox to include 
as many tools as possible, civil sanctions at one end, um, and quite serious removals of liberty uh, and fines. So I'm not saying throw that away at all. One needs to use those to protect people. However, there is another group of people who um, may break rules by accident or because they're looking in a different direction and forget about it or they're not competent to do it, but they are basically um, wanting to do the right thing. And therefore, uh, the whole approach around uh, support under the Hampton approach and the primary authority model is to try and get them improved in their performance. And fines don't necessarily do that. They may be relevant, they probably aren't in most situations, but one needs to distinguish the motivations and the purposes and the, and the outcomes that we're actually trying, trying to do. Are we trying to protect society from people who really are, are appalling and need to be dealt with? That's one thing and one set of tools. And, or are we trying to improve and help uh, and therefore reduce risk with a number of other people? That is difficult because it needs a whole range of different tools and much broader understanding. But it's very clear that if you use uh, enforcement tools that are perceived as hard on people who think they're trying to do the right thing, they think that's unfair and actually their level of performance go and compliance goes down. You, you destroyed the motivation. I've got <laughs> quite a number of psychology textbooks where that is absolutely taken for granted and proved in many, many studies. So we have to be more focused and intelligent about what we're trying to do and how we achieve it. A lot of what you do does involve the difficult bit and all the rest of it. But one needs to understand that there is a broader landscape here, which is much more complex. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I think we probably have another question as well. Uh, I don't think Charles will be able to answer any questions at the moment. He is struggling a bit to hear. But again, one of the questions I think, again, Chris, may be directed to you is about the regulatory horizon scanning. Wouldn't it also be helpful if the government helped existing regimes to keep up with the technological and social change? For example, a fundamental piece of taxi licensing regime dates back to 1847, statutory nuisance 1930s or before. And that question is from Simon Wilkes. I don't know if anyone has any comments on that. Chris, do you want to mention yeah. that? The short answer is yes. <laughs> all, all rules and all approaches need to be updated all the time. And... Um, I, I think this is a continuous process. One of the consequences of adopting an outcome-based cooperative regulation um, regime holistically would mean that there would be a lot of conversations going on about saying, do we need to update how we're doing things? Do we need to update the rules? Do we need more guidance? And working together to achieve that. Um, there were some interesting comments about <laughs> at the start of the chat about working together between the two organisations represented here. Well, just think what you could do if it's not just your two um, public organisations, but actually loads of businesses and other regulators as well, all working together. How do we do that? It must be possible. So if you do that, then there would be constant looking at, at, at improvement, basically. And I think we have one as well from Paul Malon about how could we operate, how could the OBCR operate to be effective in the dispersed, diverse environment when there are thousands of businesses operating in many channels across 300 plus local authorities, product safety, food safety and information. What, what would it look like to have that sort of cooperation? Well, it, it, one needs to bring together a number of a large number of people, but a number of different silos at the moment. So as Charles was just saying, regulation typically comes into an awful lot of complex silos, food safety, nuclear, health and safety, et cetera, et cetera, environmental. Um, but you've also got small businesses and um, th there is a cooperative piece with a large number of local authorities. One mechanism, which I think has worked well, but needs to be uh, updated 
uh, is primary authority, which is a mechanism for pulling people together. But it's interesting that the basis of that really is local discussions. So I see local organization going towards regionalism and, and leveling up agenda as absolutely central to this. And, and I see you as being central to this. Um, because it, it, there are a lot of lot of discussions which one needs to have locally. The, the question then is, how does one relate to a large number of different national-based regulators? Well, I think that is a framework organisation, perhaps inspired by a primary authority type approach, um, which I think is being discussed at the moment uh, at, at high level, um, involving a different approach to saying, let's all work together under an OBCR type of approach. So in other words, one needs to re-examine the frameworks and the connections, but you need to get an integration between lots of locally organized bits and national arrangements. It's not impossible, but we haven't uh, we haven't completed that yet. Yeah, I mean, I think that goes towards answering the question we have from Neil Beakin as well about the end-to-end -end enforcement and how you would consider the resources and the approaches within the teams like the local authorities and the wider criminal justice system as well. So everything can be used effectively. So we are moving towards that, would you say, Chris? And hopefully. Well, I hope we are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think all the building blocks and all the learning are there. And I, and I, I just hope that there are um, sufficiently in, enlightened discussions going on. I do know of some actually to pull it together and say if if we behaved in a different way and organized ourselves differently we'd achieve so much more yeah uh, gareth I, I was going to say yvonne um, we so one of the pieces of work that unchecked have been doing for the last three years is our annual the enforcement gap report and it it, it codifies some of the challenges that the regulatory organizations face not just in terms of the loss of the budgets that they've had but that's unquestionable but also the the, the loss of individuals that work for them, but also just the increasingly number of new responsibilities placed upon them by government when they want to regulate something new without really thinking about what that regulation looks like and how it will manifest. And we are in, we, we are we are collecting uh, anecdotally, we are collecting lots of testimony from uh, regulatory bodies that say that they are having to move much more to um, enforcement after a breach rather than proactive work to prevent breach in the first place and, and actually one of the things that we're looking at doing is looking at what is the cost of that to the UK because the enforcement is expensive a breach is a is, is a concern for the public and if if we were to go to a preventative measure then you could both have better levels of enforcement of existing regulation and probably done in a way that is more financially viable for those organizations Thanks, Gareth. I think actually we're moving towards Danny Maxim's question actually about the trading standards. Some of them aren't self-evidencing in terms of non-compliance, and that does require a proactive approach. But the models used to prioritise it don't account for that. So how do we avoid overlooking the value of inspections if the triggers that actuate it are too weak? I think... Uh, does that, do Chris, would you like to comment on how we get the triggers right, really? Again, I think that we're sort of in the middle of quite a significant transformation because one looks at where are things right and where are they not right? And the ways of doing that are changing these days, firstly because of IT and remote monitoring and AI. Um, and secondly, because of this cooperative approach, um, part of my model has been used in Australia by um, energy and water regulator who is working with a number of small businesses to say, I can't possibly impose the normal, enormous amount of requirements that I on you if you share an energy source or a water source among say 10 homesteads or 10 businesses in the outback as I would impose on a big electricity generator let's just build it up from the bottom basic confidence a code of saying we're going to do the right thing anything goes wrong ring us but you can also add in remote monitoring at that point so that we can check what you're doing now discussions in the food chain are going place uh, ongoing globally about um, 
authorities globally as well as nationally with the FSA, um, private accreditation systems which um, are, are used by all the major food producers and supermarkets and saying, can't we actually fuse these to some extent so we don't need to um, inspect every single uh, site if we trust the organisation. And that model is proving to be not only popular, but um, extremely effective, as I understand it, talking to the FSA and the supermarkets, that the supermarkets are regarded as one entity because they are regulating their own sites. Now, you take that further in supply chains around the world with blockchain elements and you bring in data so you can say not only what chemicals have been used on, on this field, but also how the things have been stored. Can we trust it or is it fraudulent? So in other words, systems, data, but codes of behavior with people who are trusted to, to do it right and, and earn that trust. And then, of course, you keep inspections. Of course, you keep enforcement where you need it. But usually, you, you wouldn't use the same enforcement tools if something goes wrong. You just put it right. It's very simple. Thank you, Chris. I think we have to move to our last question now. And Gareth, I think this one's for you from Paul Lewis. Where your research has indicated that protections afforded by the EU regulation should remain, are we at risk that those who shout loudest and the media with an agenda could override the majority feedback? That's a political question, and I I, I leave that for you. <laughs> if I'm, I don't particularly want to tread into that that area. What I think is we should have perfectly straightforward rules and codes of behaviour, and very effective tools and very effective systems. Um, I will just make a personal comment without my RHC hat that I actually think the sort of behavioural changes that are going on in the UK are ones that come naturally to us. And it's got nothing to do with common law approach or civil law approaches, by the way. But actually, the rather legalistic approach of, of Europe will find it difficult to do them. And I actually think that's good news for, the, for Britain and the British economy. Thank you, Gareth. Have you any comments on that? Yeah, so I mean, our, I put a link into the chat to all of our research papers because they are quite extensive. So please do feel free to, to, to peruse them at your leisure. Um, no, no one we speak to and talks to us about the idea that you know regulation. And we're, we're, so we're trying to do two pieces of work. The, the first is we're trying to get all the people that we are talking with and working with through our sixty odd supporters who are part of the organisation to think about how they talk about regulation. And we still see it. We still see people that are inherently on our side and part of the, the on the side of the angels talk about red tape and burden in a way which, you know, it, it simply isn't, but it's the lexicon that we've all bought into as uh, because the, those that wish to deregulate have successfully framed it as such. And we're doing lots of work with organisations say, look, don't talk about burdens, talk about protections. Don't talk about red tape, talk about protections. Talk about talk about these in a positive way. Um, we're also working across that organisation to sort of say, actually, you know, if you are the Woodland Trust and you are interested in some of the environmental regulations, there is a golden thread that links what you're trying to do with what some of the people for safer internet safety are trying to do and what some of the organisations are who are talking about river pollution and also some of the organisations that talk about consumer rights and what the TEC is saying about workers' rights. And, it, and it's not, and we're trying to unbrick some of those silos where people talk about the issue rather than the principle. So to answer the question, yes, I think there is a potential danger that those with the loudest voices who shout loudly about the regulation in Singapore and terms of those things are at the moment have the ear of the right people. However, the public attitude simply doesn't back that up. And the work that we're doing, and if anybody wants to work with us, we, we will snap your hands off. If you want to work with us, we, we are trying to work with politicians, with um, influencers to say, look, actually, this isn't popular. And all of our data shows that it's not electorally popular with your voters either, and we can stand that up till the cows come home. But this is about, and we talk about murmurations, you know, at the moment there are lots of people doing their own little thing. We want to build a murmuration of, of organisations that are all pulling in the same direction with their own little slant. And I think that we can do that. And some of the engagement and some of the feedback that we're getting on the work we're doing 
on the, uh, the, 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 the rule bill, the EU law uh, bill, is starting to pay dividends. We are starting to get some interactions and some conversations with people that we didn't think were going to be natural allies to us, but who understand that actually you can't just switch everything off on day 101 and expect it all to work properly. And, and, and that if nothing else, that the, they are hearing from untraditional voices like the WI who are saying, this is a really silly idea, why are you doing it? And I think that that is helping us move the argument, but we're certainly not winning it yet. Well, thank you very much. And can I thank all of, of our speakers today, Gareth, Chris and Charles, if you can hear me. And also thank you to all of who've asked the questions. I'm really sorry we haven't had time for all the questions, but we are moving into a comfort break now. Um, and the next session will start at 10.45. So please feel free to go and get a drink or whatever else. Thank you for your time.
Hello and welcome back to our next session. In the last session we heard how important the public do see the standards and in this session we're turning to how we address the workforce challenges in 2023 and the speakers are going to consider the significant pressure we have around the workforce capacity, challenges around the ageing workforce and recruitment as well as the challenges around succession planning. How do we make the profession more attractive to people at different points in their career and also thinking creatively about funding the service. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, who is John Herriman, Chief Executive of the CTSI. Lovely. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, just checking you can hear me and see me. Perfect. Um, right. Yes. Yeah, really good to be here. And uh, just firstly to say thank you to everybody um, who's supporting the year ahead. And it's a really important opportunity for us to come together with CIH and the Institute of Licensing uh, as regulatory services professions um, who are working very closely on that front line together. Um, and I was actually really pleased that we all came together uh, the other day, actually, and speaking with one voice on the retained EU law bill um, and our safeguarding our standards uh, sort of campaign, uh, because we've all got to stand up for consumers uh, and businesses. And I did see a comment in the, the chat earlier, um, which was um, saying how we're better when we work together. And I couldn't agree with your comment more, uh, Alison. So I, I made a note of that when I saw it. So I've been asked to provide a very brief perspective um, on uh, workforce challenges and whether we're at a, a tipping point or a turning point. Uh, and I know much of what I'm going to say is going to be common to us all. Um, and, uh, and obviously my focus is going to be on trading standards. So my, my first point um, is about the increasing demand on, on trading standards, both in terms of day-to-day -day enforcement and business support activity, but also um, with regard to you know, other contingent uh, type operations or crises like, uh, like the avian flu outbreak, uh, which is the worst ever. Uh, we've also got a, a backdrop of increasing consumer detriment uh, and declining consumer and business confidence uh, and every indication um, that that's going to continue and get worse for the foreseeable future, particularly as we head into the winter. Uh, and within that, we know that the vulnerable uh, are going to be more vulnerable and those that weren't vulnerable are going to become, uh, become, be gonna become so. Um, and I think we saw that during the pandemic uh, and the same is going to happen during the cost of living crisis. And so we've got that perfect storm at the moment of the long term social economic consequences of the pandemic, uh, the EU exit, the cost of living crisis, uh, and all of which has been exacerbated uh, by the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, plus, we've also got that steady stream of new burdens, um, and has already been mentioned uh, more than once, uh, a backdrop of regulatory reform. And whilst there are real opportunities to make the law simpler, uh, which we'd embrace, um, that may end up inadvertently or potentially deliberately uh, removing important protections for consumers uh, and businesses if it's rushed, as the current government plan is. Um, and so what that means is that the demand on trading standard services are increasing um, and becoming more complex. Uh, and we're seeing a rise in scams, doorstep crime, unsafe products, heating oil fraud, fraud uh, illegal money lending. Uh, the list is endless, uh, as we all know. And people and communities are undoubtedly less safe as a result. That leads on to my second point, um, is that trading standard resources against that backdrop of increasing demand have been cut over the last decade. And we heard that from the National Audit Office earlier, and that's 50% over the last sort of decade or so. And we've also got an aging demographic in the profession, uh, numbers now leaving, which I've seen get worse in the 18 months that I've been Chief Executive CTSI. Uh, and over the next five to 10 years, the, the natural outflow is going to increase uh, due to retirements, for example. Uh, plus, we also need to be uh, more representative of the communities that we serve, not least because we know that the most disadvantaged groups in society will be the most impacted. And sadly, those are overrepresented um, amongst ethnically, ethnically diverse communities. Um, and also, just as an aside, trading standard services other than in Northern Ireland, which have benefited from an additional resource um, to cope with the Northern Ireland protocol, they've all been paired back to the bone, uh, as we know, and any additional cuts um, are going to directly impact on the ability to protect local communities and support businesses. And it is worth noting uh, that because of the extra capacity in Northern Ireland, they've reinvigorated the ability for trading standards to respond to consumer complaints, public complaints which in turn has just shown how many problems there actually are. And those problems exist in the rest of GB. It's just that they're not visible because the capacity doesn't exist to spot or respond to them. Um, and that's not good for consumer confidence, which in turn impacts on market confidence, which in turn impacts on economic recovery. 
Um, and sadly, we're unlikely to see uh, an influx of capacity like that in England. They've had in Northern Ireland, and we won't see that in Wales or Scotland either. So it's in many respects a sort of a pretty depressing picture, uh, which I know is incredibly hard for trading standards professionals to cope with, not least because we know how many people are at risk on a daily basis, um, yet we're often unable to do anything to help the vast majority of them um, who we know are at those increased risks. So where does that leave us, which is on to my third point, um, and that is that despite that depressing picture, I think there are still many things that we can do. Uh, and I believe that we have a responsibility as a profession and collectively as regulatory services uh, to take some proactive and innovative um, steps to address the issues. And I'm pleased to say that I think we are, albeit there's a, a long journey ahead. Um, but there is also a real responsibility on government, especially DLUC, um, who own the strategic resourcing and regulatory services question, which I don't think they've owned at the moment. Um, and they, uh, and we need to collectively apply that pressure um, to them. Um, and I'm pleased to say, see that there were no cuts to public spending over the next sort of couple of years in the autumn statement, but we need to make sure that trading standards and regulatory services are protected and also that we see some investment um, so we can get the system working uh, as it should do. Now, also from a, a trading standards perspective, uh, just thinking about the things that we're doing, there is a need for us to raise the profile of our work protected consumers uh, and supporting businesses. Um, we've many years, I think, been the hidden service. Um, yeah, we're absolutely critical to protecting local communities as well as providing that contingency resource, for example, um, in responses like avian flu or COVID-19. And we don't have the same profile in trading standards, I don't think, as licensing or maybe public health. So we've got to connect our work um, with the broader issues of public interest so we become more visible as trading standards. Um, and I think there are examples of where that's been done very well, but we need to do that and more and make that the norm. And that is part of the role of CTSI uh, to make sure that we do that uh, nationally. I think we also need to see uh, the government recognises the, the role of trading standards on the front line of protecting the public, uh, working alongside the CMA who take a broader strategic role, but they're one step removed and it's actually frontline trading standards who are on that front line. Um, and we're going to be making sure that trading standards uh, through CTSI and our work with others um, gets that profile. And we're going to be moving to a more sort of campaigning um, and lobbying sort of footing, particularly as we start to look through general elections in a year or so's time. Um, and I also think within trading standards, we need to recognise that our biggest strength, uh, which is our agility and flexibility across um, you know, more than 250 pieces of legislation, is also a weakness because some people don't necessarily know what we do because of that breadth. And we need to absolutely capture and show what Trading Standards does more explicitly. Uh, and we're working in partnership with, with AXO, National Trading Standards, Scots, uh, Trading Standards Northern Ireland and Trading Standards Wales uh, in order to do that. Um, and then what that will do is I think it will help us also to raise the profile of the work of the profession to attract new entrants, especially those from more diverse backgrounds and those from college or mid-career. Um, so we can show the exciting and incredibly rich careers that someone can have in the trading standards world. And every apprentice and, and trainee that I've spoken to, um, but some very recently, um, just is absolutely hooked from the moment they see uh, what the profession does. And we need to see more of that, make it more visible, um, and also to make sure they can see there are long-term prospects in the world of trading standards and regulatory services and ensuring that trading standards are seen as a career uh, and not just a job that somebody does for a short period of time. Um, also, I think there's working in partnership with other regulatory professions to promote those entry routes, and that's uh, especially around apprenticeships. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that within trading standards, there will be a level six trading standards practitioner from spring of next year, uh, which will build on the success of the of the level four. Uh, and I'm also hoping that we can combine forces with uh, the other regulatory professional bodies on National Apprenticeship Week to really promote careers in regulatory services um, and also making sure we're attracting people from more uh, sort of increasingly diverse backgrounds. And we're doing that not just in England, obviously where the focus is at the moment, but also in Scotland with the Modern Apprenticeship Scheme. And also I was in Wales the other day where they're looking to um, explore um, and make the case for apprenticeships and having some success. And we're looking to support across um, all four nations to do that. Um, and I think also we have opportunities to work much more explicitly with businesses, um, something that many services do, I know. But this is where finding ways to help businesses with compliance is important because the best way to protect consumers um, in the first instance is going to be making sure that businesses do the right thing in the first place. And that shows how trading standards are key then to supporting the economy, something I don't think we make enough of. And enforcement is a key part of that system. Uh, but we also need to make sure that we're thinking about innovative ways to operate across the full spectrum of the regulatory 
and non-regulatory landscapes that, um, that Chris Hodges was talking about a little bit earlier. And obviously we're involved in that um, through CTSR with consumer codes and ADR. Um, and then I think there's also opportunities around sort of um, increased uh, collaboration across multidisciplinary teams. We've seen that in COVID, the pandemic, avian flu, um, and that's why events like this year ahead are so important to us. Um, and then in terms of if I just sort of close, in terms of if I look at it in terms of whether we're at a tipping point or whether we're at a turning point, um, I'm ever the optimist. I think there's a, a tipping point if we don't solve some of the issues and we can't make the case. But actually, I think we could be at a turning point if we use the evidence that is in absolute abundance out there to continue to make the case. Uh, then I think we can convince others uh, of actually the important work that we do and make that more uh, visible to everybody. And that's what we're trying to do through our new vision and strategy, building a fairer world uh, for consumers and businesses and why events like this um, are so important as we all come together and demonstrate that collaboration uh, very much in the in the public eye. So I'll uh, come to a close there, Yvonne, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, and I look forward to working with you further on the Consumer Protection All Party Group as well. Very much so, yes. <laughs> Um, so I now move to Stephanie Apia Anderson, who's trustee of the CIEH. Stephanie. Uh, hello, Stephanie. Sorry, the mic is muted. We can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Um, good morning, all. Um, the first question I have before I go on with the presentation is, if our professions were to fade out, would the public initially take any notice? Um, today's topics that I'm going to be talking about will be looking into different ways to prevent such occurrences from happening, highlight our great work and find ways to draw new individuals, whether that's mid-career change or new starters into our professions. Um, I currently work as an environmental health officer um, in West London in the food and workplace safety team. I think the sound appears to have gone from Stephanie. Uh, we'll, we'll see if we can get that back. Yeah, I think she's dropped out completely, unfortunately. Um, we'll see if we can get her back. And if not, we may have to move to the next person if they're available and perhaps come back to Stephanie, if that's possible. Oh, for the days of in person again. <laughs> Yeah, I think we will have to move actually now to uh, John Garforth from the Institute of Licensing and hopefully fully we can come back to Stephanie later. If we can move perhaps to John, sorry to put you on the spot so early. It's quite all right, thank you. Can you see and hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning all. Um, my name is John Garforth, I'm the Vice Chairman of the Institute of Licensing. Um, I'm just here, a bit like John Herriman, to set the scene in relation to regulatory services from a licensing uh, perspective. Um, as you're no doubt aware, licensing services offer a wide range of areas of um, licensing work, uh, from taxis to alcohol, from entertainment to gambling, street trading, scrap metal and animals, to name but a few. Uh, licensing historically has been set up differently than trading standards and environmental health as there haven't been prerequisite qualifications to enter the profession. Often people um, start um, as a trainee, get trained on the job, go on a suite of courses and build up their competence uh, that way. However, the Institute is now working with a new awarding body partner and are looking at a suite of licensing qualifications tailored for the future. That's a really exciting time for us. Um, that will put uh, licensing on a, a different level pegging and hopefully people can enter the profession with some qualifications 
or in fact, um, already be in the profession and and, and sit in that can prove the competence, particularly if presenting at committees or, or, or in court, which is obviously a challenge from time to time. Um, as like I said, new officers um, come in um, with sometimes little experience in licensing and that leaves a void straight away from their predecessor who's often left with years of experience and as the profession is getting older and the, the, the age demographic um, is increasing at uh, the, the higher end of working life, uh, that, does, that does pose um, challenges. Um, staff also move around areas to get more pay or other experiences. You often find not just in licensing, I'm in Greater Manchester, and uh, we see the same faces appearing, but at, at, a, at an adjacent or another local authority, they're just moving around. Uh, what is needed is in licensing, understanding that fee setting, which in the most part is discretionary to, to local authorities, can fund licensing services and that both officers and elected members of council shouldn't be afraid to make sure that they are bolstered in terms of work numbers um, and that their fees are set at a level that they can provide an efficient and effective service. Licensing can be cost neutral. There are areas of licensing, particularly um, in the alcohol and gambling um, area which which are um, set by government or capped but all the other areas aren't and we are able to uh, recover our costs um, if allowed to do so through our budget setting process. Um, improved access to qualifications is, is important. Um, government funding if there is to be any um, and apprenticeships is the way to go. Um, qualifications is um, a way in which you can see the value of what you're offering to the public and to businesses. You can get that depth of understanding of the area of work that you're involved in and share those experiences with other regulators in your profession and in other regulatory professions like we're seeing here today. It's also really important, again like today, that we're working together as professional bodies, that we're government, that we've got that in to the, the key um, people, the, the ministers and the civil servants, and we're seeing a lot more of that um, as of late, I'm, I'm pleased to say, um, albeit more recently um, some of the government agendas have been curtailed by um, Brexit and Covid and issues of, over the summer with uh, government appointments. But um, it, it is really important that um, we, we do work with government and we do work together to get the best for our consumers, for our residents and for our businesses in our communities. But those that working with government and, and the budget savings that have to be made across the country by, by local government um, does make one wonder how the future will, will look. Um, is joining up with shared services, which does already happen a, across the country um, in a sort of a county model, going to be more prevalent? Is that going to happen more often in the world of licensing? The government have indicated they're going to consult on creating some, you might call it, super taxi licensing authorities at the moment. There are nearly 300 councils in England and Wales, um, or in England, um, who um, undertake a taxi licensing function. One option is to reduce that to nearly 80 by having it at unitary, county or combined authority level. So, for example, in Greater Manchester, that would mean merging the taxi licensing functions of 10 councils into one 
but that's just for taxi licensing. That would leave other areas of licensing still at um, local level. Um, but that's all part of the leveling up agenda. Would that make savings? Yes, it possibly could. Would it help with demand and provide better services? Possibly it could. So there's a lot, a lot going on um, on the on different agendas, both locally and nationally, which could help focus minds on um, the importance and the future of, of our services. Primary authority, which has been going for a number of years now, does bring money in to authorities and does provide that support to businesses who want that best book advice and, and best practice. However, we've got to be careful that we don't do too much of that in order that businesses suffer if councils focus too much on the income generation streams and not on their wider regulatory offer. Turning back to rec recruitment uh, for, a, for a moment, um, well, I think we do need better recruitment campaigns um, for regulatory services we are often um, the, the hidden and whilst yes licensing does get its mention and certainly planning does um, you do often find that unless there's something really big going on in an area um, or often food hygiene or um, fly tipping uh, prosecutions um, raised in the in the it, it doesn't always get the profile. I think that's something we need to do, not only with um, the public and businesses, but with uh, local councillors. Not, not forgetting that councillors in this whole process of local government are key to the decisions that are made about our budgets. And they have to see our value. They have to see our successes. And they have to see us out in the community doing work so do tell them about those successes and challenges do keep your press offices involved do keep your employment teams involved when when looking for new people and as i said keep that um, engagement with institutes government um, and the like well involved so in closing all i'm going to say um is to officers who are, who are out there on the streets doing the work, providing that advice to, to elected members, make sure we're showcasing our talents. Make sure that that value is shown um, because there are very many challenges ahead. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to hear from someone in Greater Manchester and it's good to hear from licensing. My husband chairs licensing in Wigan, so we're quite involved with that. Um, now, I'm afraid we haven't managed to get uh, Stephanie back yet, so we're going to move to Dr Amanda Sara, Director of Qualifications, the Royal Society of Public Health, as our next speaker. So over to you, Amanda. Hi, Yvonne. Can you see me? I can't see, but I can hear you. And I can see the slides. OK, great. Um, my camera should be on. Ah. Oh, there I am. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's talk on turning point or tipping point, how we address the workforce challenges in 2023. And I'd really like to reiterate what the last two speakers have said with regards to the importance of partnerships across organisations. So it's lovely to be here and working so closely with CIEH today. Um, we all know the important contribution that we all make to improving public health and reducing health inequalities. Um, CIEH clearly states that it ensures the highest standards of professional competence in its members in the belief that through environmental health, actions people can have a positive action on people's health improvement 
Um, so let me give you a bit of context um, to myself. Um, so I'm Dr. Amanda Sara, Director of Qualifications at the Royal Society of Public Health, RSPH, and I'm responsible for RSPH's awarding organisation. So staff in this area develop and maintain RSPH's extensive suite of public health qualifications. So we're a large public health provider and are recognised as a high quality provider with a high rate of pass. And we run over 70 qualifications ranging from, for example, built environment, so that could be level one award in asbestos awareness, all the way through to level five diploma in adjudication in the construction industry. We offer a variety of quals in emergency planning and HACCP, as well as food safety, for example, level one award in food hygiene awareness, all the way through to level four award in managing food safety and hygiene. We also cover health and safety quals, for example, covering health and safety in the workplace to manual handling and supervising. Um, so these are just a few, so please obviously have a look at our website. It will give you more details with regards to these. Um, if I just move on to the next slide. So for those of you that don't know us, um, we're the oldest public health body. We received a royal charter from our late queen. We're independent. We have over 5,000 members in the UK and globally and we provide education, qualifications, training, and evidence-based influencing. And I guess um, a common denominator, our vision is all members of the population have better health and lead healthier lives for longer. So um, coming back to the question and the key title of today's talk, um, Turning Point or Tipping Point, how will we address the workforce challenges in 2023? And for me, we, I will focus on quals um, in particular and our teams um, so that we know that it is going to be tough because any reductions in cost often leads to reductions in qualification training budgets. And we know that organisations are facing considerable challenges in today's business market but perhaps there are a few areas to consider. However, this is by no means an exhausted list. So the first challenge is reduction in budgets, which cascades into the reduction in qualification training budgets for us. So what is a possible solution at this point? Well, perhaps one of the key solutions for all professionals at this time is making the economic case for having a, an even better, highly quality, skilled and trained workforce. Um, by investing in training and qualifications over this difficult economic period can help with staff morale, keeping that high. It allows colleagues to provide an even better service. It can develop skills to adapt to change as well in as continuing to motivate colleagues. Now, the people leading and developing and managing those services at all levels um, are also would benefit from needing quality training to allow them to perform at an even better level. Investment now for all of us um, should mean that we have the people and skills to continue in their roles, wanting to continue despite the difficult um, challenges which we face ahead, so that hopefully when we get into the end of 23-24, um, things are looking a bit brighter. And I guess it's also about thinking about that we're all lifelong learners and learning doesn't stop at a particular age or ability level, we can all continue to expand our knowledge and abilities. 
So perhaps the second thing to consider is quality matters. And um, at RSPH, we're a high quality provider. And for us, we believe it's really important to continue to value and invest in quality and qualifications. The third point that I'd like us to consider is that whilst we have all been through a very, very difficult period professionally um, over the last few years in particular, we as professionals have the opportunity to influence and make positive changes within society. And therefore for us, um, really investing and supporting highly skilled and highly qualified professionals is absolutely crucial. Um, we want to invest in colleagues, which is something we feel passionate about at RSPH. Um, we believe that public health is everyone's responsibility and a skilled and trained workforce is essential for better public health. Um, so in conclusion, there is no one quick fix to this question. Um, it's an incredibly difficult and complex issue, which has many moving parts, which are moving um, at varying times. But as what has been mentioned, um, some, these are, we hope, some helpful points to consider with colleagues going forward. And I think one of the many strengths of today and tomorrow's event is the opportunity to listen to other colleagues' experiences and thoughts which may be familiar to you or may be new or may plant the seed for the journey ahead. And it also is the opportunity to network, gather contacts and reach out to individuals or organizations following today's event. So coming back to us at the Royal Society of Public Health, if qualifications are something that you want to know more about, whether it's those that we offer or ones which you would like us to consider developing, please do get in contact and we can work together. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference over the next couple of days and please do get in contact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amanda, for that presentation. We are going to move to Graham Mitchell, who's the programme leader for BSC Honours Environmental Health at Liverpool John Moores. And we are hoping to, to get Stephanie back after that. We'll see if we can get our mic on. So over to you, Graham. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. I'm just tidying myself up now. I'm on camera. Um, I should have some slides. I don't know if they're able to be. Ah, there they go. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my name is Graham Mitchell. I'm the, the programme leader for environmental health at Liverpool John Moores. Um, my, my background is as an environmental health practitioner. Um, I sort of did that for about 20 years before jumping ship to academia. Um, I'm really going to focus a little bit more on, on sort of recruitment into professions. Um, and whilst I'll naturally talk about environmental health, I, I do think uh, it's applicable across the board. Um, I also say it's very nice of both John, John and, and Amanda, um, because I think I'm going to echo a lot of what they've said in their presentations. I've, I've got to be honest, I've, I've, I've been around a little bit um, and I'm happy that this is called turning point or tipping point and, and not another crossroads uh, because I've been to many presentations with professional bodies talking about how the profession is at a crossroads. Uh, and if I'm honest, I think I've been at so many crossroads and might have found my way back to the beginning. However, saying that, I do think at this moment in time, we are at a significant point. Uh, I think there is a real realisation that due to funding cuts, austerity, an ageing workforce, this really is a, bit, a critical time for us as professions. And the action we take now really is going to either protect us or, or doom us for the future. Um, <clears throat> so I think, although I'm a little bit cynical about crossroads, it is important to talk about it now. I think it was both both John and, and John mentioned about visibility. And I think this is the, the core that we need to address uh, for all our professions is how do we become more visible? 
how do we get the public to to know and appreciate what we're doing we're really good at what we do we're all problem solvers we get on with the job and we've done that for, for generations but we really need to be better at giving that message out to the public to councillors to other organizations about just how important we are about what good that we do it, it sounds a terrible thing to say um but some of the the situations we've been through you know the, the, the covid pandemic the work that professionals did in in trade and standards and environmental health and licensing you know we really were at the sharp end of enforcing covid legislation but we never really got acknowledgement for that i don't think certainly not publicly you know on, on the scale of things we, we didn't get the same acknowledgement that we should have done now i fully appreciate no one comes into these professions to 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 receive the accolades it, it doesn't happen i know that but i think one of the key things is if we can become more visible if we can raise ourselves up the conscience of the public then that ties into to getting more people interested into our profession which then will result in more people applying for either university courses or training courses or applying for jobs. And I think that's, that's the key. I was fortunate enough to, to go to the States uh, in the summer and, and the colleagues in America have this phrase that environmental health is a contact sport. Um, and it is, and I think it's true for, for trading standards and licensing. It's all about contact. This is what we do. We, we communicate with, with businesses, with organizations, with the public. It's all about contact. And I think if we are looking to promote the professions, what we need to do is, is take the fact that every contact that we have as a professional uh, is an opportunity to promote the profession. How we act, how we engage, how we encourage people, it, it, you know, every opportunity we need to take that to do it. Because I think the responsibility for promoting the profession, to, for increasing that visibility, doesn't just lie with, with one person or with one group. It is all our responsibility. It's the responsibility of the professional bodies. It's the responsibilities of organisations like uh, LGMU, like universities who are providing courses it's responsibility of the individual professionals on the ground it, it really is all our responsibility because that's how people get to know who we are that's how people get to know what we do and how good we are at it I, i've put this slide up because i think there's three groups of people that we we really need to target um, the first group and i think has been mentioned is is the career changes um, certainly in, in the course that I do in environmental health, a number of the students who come to us are people who already had a career and decided that they don't want to do it. Uh, they they want to change. Uh, the classic for us would be someone in catering. Um, they get to a point in their life where they think that, you know, working in a kitchen, it's long on sociable hours for not a lot of pay. And they've got to make a decision in life. Are they happy to accept that? Uh, do they want to strike off and do their own business or they do want to do something else but around that that kind of area predominantly food safety so we can target those people those people who want to change careers the next group i think is is what I've, i struggle to come up with a name for them i'll be honest but i think they're called the fallers in the, the people who kind of accidentally fall into these professions um and i think if if we're honest there's very few of us who sort of at 16, 17 decided that the profession we're doing now is the profession that we wanted to do. Um, certainly from my own perspective, you know, I, I signed up to do psychology as a degree and, and somehow ended up in environmental health. Um, and there's that group of people who want to do something, maybe in a similar kind of vein, but we can convince them to change into environmental health, into trade standards, into licensing. So they've got that idea that they want to do something, but they're not quite sure what it is. The final area is, is, is the first choices. And I think this is the ultimate aim that we need to, to get people to do. This is the sort of 16, 17 year olds. When they're making those choices about going into university, when they're making their choices about going into the world of work, 
we want to be their first choice. We want to, to give them the advice, the guidance, the insight into what our professions are so they see it as a first choice. And I think this is the big area for, for us to expand upon. This is the long-term goal, if you like, is, is to make our professions the first choice for people coming out of school. The first two, that the career changes, the fall is in, they, they are short and medium-term goals, I think. But the long-term goal of all of us you know, as I say, environmental health is a contact sport, is to, to make people aware of what we do, to make them make our professions their first choice. I, I, th I think I've got to end. I was, I was told I've got to be really brief. Um, I've got to end by saying there is no silver bullet out there, unfortunately. You know, th there isn't a pool of environmental health officers, trained standards officers um, out there. You know that we can suddenly draw upon and we can get 10,000 people suddenly appearing. It is a long term thing. You no, know, we have to talk about the profession, we have to get into schools, and not just the, when people are making choices. If we want this to work, if we want people to be picking our professions as their choice, we need to get in as early as we can and keep reinforcing that message. And as I say, that's that's not just me working in a university and doing outreach there it's it's how do we build that for our communities how do we build that for our schools our universities all these kind of things have got to tie in together and i think increasing that visibility not only improves the profession but gives us that wider reach that wider opportunity of inclusion where you know people who wouldn't have thought about this um for various reasons are going to look at our profession. And I think if we can get more people reflecting their communities, going into environmental health, going into uh, trading standards and licensing, that has to be a good thing. That's got to be the way forward for us. So as I say, thank, thank you for listening. Um, as I told, I, I was told I had to be brief, but uh, yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Graham. Um, we are trying to get Stephanie back, but we haven't at the moment. So we are going to move to questions. And reflecting on the, what we've heard so far, I think the, the key to this is visibility. Because when I used to find that when I worked at CAB, people only realised the range of work when they needed it. And if it's not there, then everyone will suffer. We have a question from Alison Farrer about how, how do you see trading standards and environmental health working together in future? Do you think that embedding offices in different departments is the way forward? For example, private sector housing departments? And if so, is there a place for a shared or mirrored section within the respective qualifications to enable a new officer to hit the ground running? Now, I'm not sure if uh, John wants to come back first or... Uh, whether we go to Graham about the qualifications. John, do you want to come in? Shall I? Yeah, just unmuting. Yeah, shall I come in first on that one? Yeah, thanks, uh, Alison. Um, well, I think that the first thing is, uh, and I think hopefully this sort of two days sort of represented, there are so many opportunities to collaborate and partner, um, both the CIH but also in Institute of Licensing. Um, so there are undoubtedly opportunities that we're finding at the moment, but I think there will be more opportunities in the future. Um, I think you're aware that we have a strategic sort of partnership working group between ourselves and CIH um, at the moment, which actually led to us running the year ahead together. Um, in terms of some of those more innovative opportunities, um, things like secondments, I think are fantastic. I know they've been done before um, historically, and I do find myself um, being posed with a number of questions of things that used to work in the past that we don't currently do that we probably should do again. Um, so I do think it's worth exploring opportunities and trying to sort of blur those boundaries a little bit between uh, the traditional sectors, whether that's sort of not-for-profit, private, and, um, uh, and and also sort of public sector. Because uh, I think that also broadens understanding between uh, all three, uh, which helps us then collaborate across the sectors to solve some sort of common challenges uh, with consumers and businesses. So I do think there are opportunities that we should or would wish to look at uh, around secondments um, in the future. So that will be very interesting. Um, and then in terms of the qualification, um, yeah, I do think there are opportunities to work much more closely um, uh, with regard to 
um, sort of aspects of the qualification. Something again that I think we'd be interested in as uh, well. I know we'd be interested in as CTSI, uh, and I think CIH so have mentioned in the past, um, and particularly because we're just doing some work with the FSA as CTSI. And there's natural overlaps there between sort of standards and food hygiene. Um, so some real opportunities to potentially collaborate, which I hope that we can start to look at in the, the not too distant future. Uh, thanks, John. Um, Amanda, do you want to come in on the qualifications issue? Hi, thank you. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, so some really interesting points. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess similar to what John has said, um, obviously, as I've already touched upon, we offer a variety of qualifications at our SPH, including food safety. Um, and in addition to those that we offer, we are keen to collaborate with other organisations and um, you know, we have um, a, a definite interest with working with CIEH and if there are qualifications that we don't offer that you are interested in us offering, um, then we can look towards um, the possibility of developing uh, new quals if there is demand. So please do get in touch. That is no problem at all. Yeah, I think... Um, it probably relates to Danny Maxim's question as well about how does trading standards, to what extent do they suffer relative to environmental health for not having degree courses available to prospective professional entrants in that? John, do you feel that there is something in that, John Herriman? Yes, um, we have undoubtedly suffered as a result of not having those sort of degree access courses. Um, I know the challenge in relation to those was the lack of volume, which was basically the lack of demand um, for, um, for students going through or from students going through. Um, so I think we have absolutely suffered there. I do hope that going forward with the, um, with the apprenticeship schemes, particularly with the level six scheme uh, starting next year, that that will then start to stimulate more interest from academic institutions. Um, and then that starts to get that sort of pathway reinvigorated again because it, it's undoubtedly impacted in the past because it cut off an entry route and it also meant say there was less visibility for students as they go into careers fairs etc of the work of trading standards um, so again that point about visibility that you uh, that you mentioned Yvonne that I think it's been the general theme from all of this discussion. Thank you. Um, Graham did you want to come in on any of, of the issue on qualifications? Yeah if, if I may. Um, I, I, well, on, on the general conversation, I think a lot of joint work and when it goes on, it, it comes down very much, I think, to a personal touch is, is, is officers on the ground talking to each other and building those personal links within authorities. Um, I also think, you know, there are really good examples out there of where environmental health and trade and standards have worked together really effectively. But it's how do we share that good practice? How do we get that message out within the professions? and to the wider world as well. Um, in terms of qualifications, um, I know we've talked, touched on very much about the degree apprenticeships. Um, it, it's not something we offer at LGMU. Uh, I do know a number of colleagues who offer the degree apprenticeship programme for environmental health. And I think it's fair to say that they're, they have a mixed bag of reactions to it. Um, it's not quite as easy as sort of calling students part-time students and just trying to shoehorn them into an existing degree. It is a lot more complicated than that, and there's more control by Ofsted. Uh, it, it's, a, it's not quite as simple as just shove them all into a normal degree. So I think it's a good idea, but it's I can see why some universities are hesitant towards it. Um, and my, fi my final point in terms of trading standards is, yeah, it would be a great idea for trading standards to have a degree qualification, because I think it really does raise the profile of mm. the profession. And we then start to equate ourselves with, with people like the nursing profession and the paramedics and the midwifery who get an awful lot of attention. And I think if, if we are not operating at their level, we are going to get left behind. Yes, thank you for that. Um... We haven't got uh, many more questions, but I have got a comment from Virginia Taylor about informing MPs of the work that, that, um, that they do. And that is really, really important. Don't forget to, to work with your MP. Tell them what's happening locally, if possible. 
give them something they can put in a press release about your work because quite often we're asked to write comments for the newspaper every week, every fortnight. It's quite hard to fill those all the time and make sure you're visible in those newspaper articles. I think we may be able to move back to Stephanie on the phone now. So if we can do that, we will do before we move to the end. Um, so if we can perhaps have Stephanie speak to Stephanie. Now we've got two more minutes before we can get back to her, I think. Um, is there any other comments we have? Uh, there's quite a lot of things in the questions about working together, long overdue, working together, um, how good the actual working together was in the COVID pandemic. And I think dreadful as the pandemic was, we did learn a lot of lessons from various places about the importance of shared working in that. Uh, John Garforth, have you any comments you'd like to make before we move to Stephanie? Can, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can. It says at my end, the microphone's not working, so I'm on a mobile phone. Uh, compatible with the platform. But, um, I think just on the um, on the working together, um, one, of the, one of the people earlier in the, in the chat put about the multi-skill departments that are appearing um obviously we've got the we've got regulated services office now for, for what, compliance and enforcement and i'm all in favor of that i think we've just got to be aware that we're not putting officers in a position it's all so thinly spread across different services that they lose some of that knowledge and expertise and cpd that is so important to what they do so it's so it's finely balanced i think as budgets get cut and cut and cut as unfortunately that they are um i think we're going to see more of that. um and that's why the apprentice is so, are so important to bring to bring in that funded new new, uh, new bodies in, into the into the services um but we've got to keep that professional expertise of our young people who are so they so thinly spread the illusion of that knowledge there. Yeah. Thank you, John. Um, I'm, I think Steph has asked us to do her poll if she can't get on. We're hoping to get her on at the moment. Uh, but perhaps we could move to Steph's poll and see if people could do that. I mean, there's quite a lot of uh, information in the chat about some of the issues that have had experienced staff supporting enough mm. experienced staff to actually support the apprentices. I think in the days of shrinking budgets, it's quite hard to do both. We know we need more staff, but we also need those staff to be out on the ground as well as supporting apprentices. Yeah, can I comment on that, Yvonne? That... Of course. Yeah, I think it's, um, and this has come up in a number of the branch meetings that I've been out to, because um, obviously, the, on the one hand, it's uh, uh, the need is to get more people into the profession and the apprenticeship routes, and actually, there are less qualified people now moving around uh, between roles, so therefore, we need new trainees, students uh, doing apprenticeship routes or the qualification, but then that does create that um, additional burden. So, you know, the solving of the one challenge, which is bringing people in and then needing to do the qualification, then creates the Second challenge, which is actually how do you train them uh, and share that um, and share that workload. So I think this is where we can start to think innovatively, hopefully, and seeing that in some regions uh, where actually they're sharing the uh, the training burden, shall we say? I don't, the burden is the wrong word, but sharing the sort of the training workload of trainees across different sort of authorities uh, and starting to combine. And again, that might be an opportunity for us to be working together as professional bodies as well. Yeah. Graham, did you want to come in yeah, on that? Sorry, I, 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 I think the, the, the training problem has got to be solved. It's as simple as that. Because if you're not training people, you won't have any officers. Hmm. And it's as simple as that. You know, if, if you are not prepared 
to invest in people coming into the organizations, local authorities, professional bodies, they just will not exist. Um, so it has to be solved. And I think we've got to accept certainly with, with uh, degree apprenticeships, you know, they are employed, there are roles that they can do. Um, and it always kind of amuses me and, and kind of disheartens me when I talk to professionals who always say, oh, I haven't got time to take a student out. I haven't got time to deal with a trainee. But you were a trainee at one point. Mm. You were a student at one point. We've all been through this as professionals. We've all been through it. And it's almost like as soon as you graduate, as soon as you become a professional, there's a switch turns off and you're not prepared to help. Um, and, and the short answer, if you don't solve it, you're not going to have anybody. Yeah, I think that seems a, a fair comment. It's just difficult for the candidate as well, as, it, as has been said, to do a full-time job, study for a qualification at the same time, um, not, just the, uh, not just the people who are supervising them. Uh, I'm still seeing if we can try and get Stephanie back at the moment. I'll just see if we have any more questions. Yeah, we have a comment, I think, from Nazir Ali about losing the advice element um, as costs the trading standards profession uh, quite dearly because they've lost some of the actual contact with the public. Yep. We've got a couple of minutes to talk about that, maybe. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll comment on that. Others can come on this as well because it's, um, again, for me, coming into the world of trading standards from outside, um, and having looked back at some of the history, um, that's undoubtedly had an impact in terms of loss of visibility with the public. Uh, so we used to have consumer advisors that sat in local authorities. There's still one or two areas where that still happens. And actually, it still happens in Northern Ireland where the system works very well. Um, but with that uh, consumer advice uh, and the complaints process moving to consumer direct and citizens advice, albeit for, for many right reasons because of the postcode lottery that existed before, has meant to say there's been a loss of direct contact between the public and trading standards and therefore a lack of awareness of the work of trading standards, which we then have to reconnect with the public in a different way through campaigning and media activity. So it's, um, it's, it's a really important point that we've... Um, that we've, we've definitely acknowledged and therefore have to find different ways to make that connection with the public. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right. I think, uh, you know, having worked from a CAB and we didn't, uh, I wasn't there when it moved over to CAB, mm. I'd left by then. But we, we have a lot of contact with trading standards because we got complaints in and we talked to you. <laughs> it's possibly lost some of that as well. Um, I think we're looking to try and get Stephanie back now. I've got another message to say that she should be coming back. <laughs> um, but there's an awful lot of comments, Graham, on your um, impassioned plea to people to train. And people are saying it does in invigorate people to actually have a trainee and remind them what they love about the job. And I thought that was a lovely comment. It because is. It's a, it's a two-way process, and I think, as Amanda says, we never stop learning. I and mean, with these professions, we never stop learning. Uh, and someone coming in, looking at issues with, with a new set of eyes, can come up with some really novel, wonderful solutions that, that no one's ever thought of. And I, I do appreciate people have got a lot of commitments. There's, a, there's fewer staff, there's more work. But I think it's about how you how you use your trainees and your students, how, how you factor them into your workforce. And, and I think you, Yvonne, you, you're right, there is a pressure on students or trainees to, to do work and do a degree as well. The, the point of the degree apprentice is it's, it is all linked in together. So if I'm teaching stuff, say, on food safety, then that, that degree apprentice should be in the food safety section. If I then swap and talk about housing, then they should be in the housing section. So it, it, there is the ability to link these things in together for the benefit of everybody. Um, it's doable, but it takes, I've got to be honest, it takes a bit of planning, it takes a bit of commitment. But at the end of the process, the authority is, is getting someone who's a professional at the end of the day. Yeah, and I think it also suits students who perhaps don't want to go down the traditional route of all... Um, university-based learning and want to see the practical examples of that and I think that's what some employers are particularly crying out for at the moment as well. 
Uh, Sarah, do you want to, uh, Amanda, do you want to talk about that at all? Sorry, I'm just trying to unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Oh, hi. Um, so, yeah, so um, just kind of building on what's been said, um, it's really important. Um, we feel that um, people are given the opportunity to develop um, through whatever route is suitable to, to reach the end game of what they want to achieve. And, you know, as Graham reiterated, the importance of being lifelong learners um, within education, things are changing all the time and will continue to change. And at some points, there's a bit of a circular motion um, with some things, as I'm sure Graham will know from his university experience. Um, but yes, it's really important to take the appropriate route which works best um, to get the end result that is required, but to maintain that ongoing training. And it really has to be a priority to ensure that employees are given those opportunities to continue to develop throughout their career. Um, apologies. Um, <laughs> That's the dog um, at all stages in their career. Thank you. I'm so sorry about the noise. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I'm also reading quite a lot of the comments about um, no cross government understanding, no ring fenced funding. Yeah, always a problem for none for that. Um, selling the relevance and importance. I was really pleased to read a comment as well about someone saying they want more voluntary opportunities. So uh, I'm, as someone who worked with volunteers for a long time, yes, it's, it's labour intensive working with them, but the value of volunteering both to the public and to the volunteers is absolutely crucial. Um, as someone who volunteered at a CAB for a short time before becoming a chief exec, it helped me get on the career I'm on now. So, uh, unfortunately, we're not able to get Stephanie on the phone. Um, we've been trying, but the presentation will be added in the handout. And we want to uh, do her poll results. But unfortunately, I don't seem to have the poll results here. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. No, it's not appeared. For me anyway um i'm just waiting for ctsi to do ah the results may be coming up click on polls no it's not working for me i'm afraid um so i think that we may have to no all I get is a blank. Sorry about that. I think we may have to have a short break before we move to the next. Ah, we've got, we have got a question actually, which is quite interesting that I can put to people. Is, is there a regional imbalance to consider attracting new staff? Is there a regional imbalance in the staffing problems? Um, is that to do with pay or, or is it not there at all? Perhaps I could move to... Uh, John Herriman to have a, to answer that one. Uh, yep, sorry, just polls come up on my screen just as I was about to talk. That. <laughs> <laughs> so I've just submitted my answer. There we go. Um, I yeah, the uh, I think the evidence going around from branches is that there is. Um, it was certainly uh, last week. I was at one of the branch meetings, and there were indications that there were other authorities that were paying more money than a particular local authority, which is meant to say that there was a potential for a sort of a brain drain from one uh, going across to another. Uh, so I, th I do think there, are, there is evidence. I haven't got the sort of the, the, the full picture on that, but it's something that I think we're starting to build at the moment around some of those geographic variations. And the most obvious one, if I look nationally across the whole of the UK, is, uh, is Northern Ireland, which doesn't have a problem at all. Uh, they are very much sort of bucking the trend. Uh, obviously, their trading standard service is based in the civil service and very different and doesn't cover public, public safety, for example. Um, but essentially, over there, they have solved the problem. Um, but it's, uh, I think we see the general issues across 
England, Wales and Scotland, and they're very similar issues. But then I do think you see some of those local variations like pay uh, that makes it more difficult for some areas to recruit than it does for others. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I've managed to move to the um, to the polls, and I've actually have got the results. And it's quite interesting that twenty one percent, twelve percent say it's more money. Twenty percent, seven percent say it's further career opportunities, and. 76% say it's absolutely everything. So it's more money, flexible working hours, more diverse workplace, further career opportunities and support from professional and member bodies. So everything together, <laughs> which I think gives everyone more challenge than before. <laughs> um, I, unless anyone has got any comments they would really like to make to wind up this session, we could wind up and have and come back for the next session at 12 o'clock, give everyone a short comfort break. Are there any other final comments from anyone that they'd like to make? Uh, Graham, you have a comment. And yeah, then... I'm, I'm going to end on a positive note, if I may. Um, and, and that's to say, when, when we do open days for students for environmental health, selling the programme, selling the career, particularly to their parents, is an easy sell. Parents of people coming in, when they hear about what we do, the variety, uh, the, the opportunities, what we do, it's an easy sell to the parents. You know, they, they appreciate what a career is, is going to be like. Um, the, the trick is getting more young people to apply uh, because the, the, I'm not saying the pressure parents put on, but the advice parents give is, is a significant factor. And if we can get more people through the door, we will get more recruits if we get more recruits we are going to increase professional membership and profess the numbers in the professional bodies which will increase finances for them it, it's as simple as that we just need more bodies through the door i'm afraid uh john harriman yeah, it's a completely agree. I think um, just a, a couple of points on echoing what graham said actually i think the, the point there is no silver bullet um, but actually the positive is that we are starting to collaborate around the, the common issues um, and, and I think that's really important that we're starting to get some traction in certain areas uh, and Graham's point I think about the attractiveness and richness of the work of regulatory services I certainly see that speaking to trading standards trainees and apprentices who've come in and their eyes completely open to what they thought we did versus to actually what we really do uh, and it's absolutely amazing to uh, to talk with them. And I think the positive is that we are starting to see a real increase in the take of apprenticeships. If I, if I went to um, Norwich, for example, they've recruited 10 apprentices uh, and that bodes well for the future. Creates another set of challenges, I know, but the positive is that we're getting the capacity in. Um, and I spoke to those apprentices and trainees uh, a couple of weeks ago and they were absolutely buzzing uh, about their futures. Yeah, and I think Amanda, you wanted to come in. Yeah, thank you. And just kind of just building on what's been said up to now, um, just to say the huge benefits of events like this, um, the ability to share one's experiences and one's stories, and for us to go away and reach out to one another, um, you know, to support one each other through the, the months to come. So please, um, do do that and do make use of these sort of events going forward they are incredibly useful so thank you well thank you for that i think we'll have a short break but i was really pleased to hear from you graham that parents are, are so pleased are taking up apprenticeships because when i was shadow minister for young people it was the parents we had to convince because people had spent so long telling them that the only way forward was for their children to get a university degree with a, an, an apprenticeship wasn't seen as a way of getting that so i think combining the two is the excellent way of bringing it both forward and we really should be pushing the value of apprenticeships and it's not an opposition to a university degree it's actually as valuable as a university degree and sometimes the practicality of it makes it more so so thank you very much to all our speakers graham amanda john and john and we will be back at 12 for our next session which is going to be about how we can support the work face of the future and the regulatory compliance officer apprenticeships. So keeping with the apprenticeship, 
So thank you very much and we'll see you at 12 o'clock shortly.
So do you want to just tell me initially just why you wanted to do that apprenticeship in the first place? The whole opportunity to learn on the job and gain a professional qualification whilst doing so greatly appealed to me. I previously did work in compliance and I did actually quite enjoy doing that. When you sort of took on board the apprenticeship, why did you sort of want to do one? I felt like, I suppose in my previous role I've, I've been working for 10 years and I'd learned a lot over that time but I felt like I was kind of stagnant seeing that you know CSA were doing um, the regulatory compliance officer apprenticeship and I thought oh that sounds really interesting. And how do you think it's benefited you so far? Uh, well without a doubt it definitely has benefited uh, because since completing the qualification in July 2020 right, I've yes. since progressed in the company, thank yes. you, I've since progressed in the company to take on a team leader role. What's it been like working alongside a sort of specialist tutor. I thought it was going to be really difficult to understand certain things but it's not you know the tutors are really helpful and um, they really make it you know that I can understand what's the type of happening and, and what I'm learning. Any particular skills and then behaviours you think you've picked up from that you didn't have before doing the apprenticeship that you might have now? Definitely I'm a lot more confident in terms of myself in terms of um, like what to do, what to look out for yeah. and all that. Would you recommend other people do this then? Would you think it's a good way of developing careers and as an individual and as a person? I think it really is important, yeah. It's it's a great way to develop a career. It's kind of a starting kind of a starting point if you want to do something new or develop something that you've learned previously, definitely. Hello, sorry about that. I had to take a quick phone call. So I apologise, I've missed that. Um, I'm hoping now that we can hear from Helen Picton, the Operational Manager of Shared Regulatory Service at Bridge End Cardiff in the Vale of Grimorden, about their journey to getting um, RCO apprentice in Wales. So if I can move to Helen now, please. Ah, I'm sorry about that. I hadn't realised we'd not done the first bit. I got a bit distracted. So I think we're going to we are going to move to Mark Keel, head of Lincolnshire Trading Standards, who also has a number of apprentices through the RCO scheme. We move to Mark. Hi, thanks, Yvonne. Uh, so yes, I'm uh, Mark Keel. I'm head of service in uh, Lincolnshire, uh, and we've had uh, apprentices uh, since 2019. Uh, prior to 2019, uh, Lincolnshire had struggled to attract applications from qualified TSOs while we were recruiting. Um, between 2011 and 2018, we only had a very small number of applications uh, from anyone who was holding either a partial or full qualification. Uh, and of those applicants, we only had two that actually turned up for an interview. Uh, and one of those was um, an ex-employee here who'd left us uh, during core offer in 2011. So we weren't getting um, qualified people. We weren't getting qualified people through. Um, now obviously, uh, we're in the same position as, as everybody else is. Uh, we have an ageing profile within the service um, and we've got a, a number of vacant possession, uh, positions on the books. Uh, and it was clear we we're going to have to take a different approach to, to recruitment. So in summer of 2019, we began uh, preparations to advertise for four Level 1 Trading Standards Officers. Uh, a Level 1 TSO post in Lincolnshire is the entry level position uh, for a prospective TSO. Um, and a successful applicant uh, can join the service with no qualifications or experience if they can show that they've got some transferable skills uh, required to be a competent officer. Uh, our career progression scheme is, is based around uh, the professional qualification. Uh, you move to level two on completing stage one and level three on completing stage two. Uh, the final level four um, can be achieved when uh, a candidate can evidence they have a broad range of, of knowledge and experience uh, within the training standards profession. Um, and we considered that uh, level four was probably achievable within five to six years of starting, depending where um, they, they join the service in the exam cycle. Um, and uh, if they're willing to put in uh, the work 
uh, required to do that. Um, the advert that we eventually ran uh, made reference to this uh, uh, opportunity for career progression. Um, even though we knew this was uh, not only challenging for the candidates, but would also be challenging for us as a service to ensure that we kept up our end of the deal. Uh, we let the advert run for around a month uh, and we achieved uh, over 270 applications for the post, uh, which was uh, far in excess of what we, we anticipated. Um, but we didn't put any restrictions on those applications uh, other than um, to have some qualification in maths, English and science at the GCSE level. Uh, we left the recruitment open, even though we could see the number of applications uh, was going up. Um, and on closing, we read them all. Uh, eventually, we shortlisted 20. Uh, and we interviewed over four days. Uh, the four successful candidates joined the service in January of 2020. And of those, two were changing career. Uh, one had worked in a call centre and had been a union rep. Uh, one had uh, worked in retail. Uh, one uh, was already employed within the authority uh, in a different area. Uh, and the last uh, candidate had been uh, one of our underage sales volunteers uh, previously uh, and had been working in a, a regulatory service within a district authority uh, before coming to us. Uh, in terms of the training, uh, we were aware of the uh, Regulatory Compliance Officer Apprenticeship at the time that we began recruiting uh, and we'd heard positive feedback from colleagues in the region who'd, who'd already uh, embarked on the RCO. Uh, however, it wasn't a driving force in the decision uh, making process in Lincolnshire. Uh, the four were employed as Trading Standards Officers, not Apprentices. Or, although as a group they're, they're still sort of affectionately referred to sort of as, as apprentices by, by the colleagues. Uh, the decision to put them on the, uh, the RCL apprenticeship uh, was done with their agreement uh, following discussions with them at the time uh, we did their inductions. Uh, it was uh, for us it was one of uh, a means to an end really for them gaining exemptions to two of the exams in stage one and professional qualification. Uh, and I suppose for a bonus for, for, for Lincolnshire was uh, we saved a little bit on, on the, uh, the, the course fees from, from that. Uh, we opted to, to use uh, CSA as the course provider uh, as they had registered with Lincolnshire County Council uh, as an apprenticeship provider uh, and they had a cohort starting uh, shortly after the, the group had started. Um, but we put some measures in place internally as well. Uh, as a group, we assigned them a training supervisor who worked very closely with them and the course tutor to ensure that they were meeting the, the, the training needs uh, and that the tutor was happy that they were on course to complete their apprenticeship successfully. Uh, this proved to be particularly beneficial as we went into lockdown shortly after they began their apprenticeship. Um, not only was, was Emma able to keep an eye on the progress uh, that they were making, she was also uh, able to take a lead in keeping regular contact with them, so uh, they, they didn't feel isolated as new recruits entering uh, the service in those unprecedented circumstances. Um, I'd just like to take the opportunity again to say thank you to, to CSA for the service they provided Lincolnshire. Uh, to date, we've had seven candidates successfully complete the RCL apprenticeship with them, a uh, 100% record. Uh, we've been really pleased with how all the officers have developed while undertaking the apprenticeship. Uh, three have become apprentice ambassadors within uh, Lincolnshire County Council, uh, and one was invited uh, by CSA to speak at the CTSI symposium in Birmingham last year, uh, together with their training supervisor. Um, she also took part in the National Apprenticeship Week. In terms of uh, supporting their ambitions, uh, all four candidates also opted to undertake the Trading Standards Law exam to complete their Stage 1 uh, of the professional qualification in conjunction with their apprenticeship. Again, to assist them and to keep up our end of the bargain, uh, we asked lead officers uh, for areas of legislation that were, fell within the syllabus to provide some additional legal training for them. This was delivered over teams due to the pandemic 
Um, we also brought in some of Peter Stanley's time to help them prepare for the, for the CTSI examination. All four candidates were successful in completing the RCO apprenticeship well within the 18 month time scale suggested. They also successfully passed the training standards law exam, completing stage one of the Chartered Professional Competency Framework. Uh, they are all still currently employed by Lincolnshire as level two TSOs uh, and are in the second year of their stage two studies. We held a debrief with them after stage one was completed. Uh, the candidates were unanimous in their choice of the apprenticeship as their preferred method of learning, finding it more supportive and more structured than studying for the training standard law paper. They were also grateful for the close relationship with a training supervisor and to the lengths colleagues had gone to in supporting their learning. The lockdowns have reduced their opportunities to go out with colleagues and get involved, but they fully understood uh, the situation. Um, but the importance was recognised uh, for candidates, uh, and we've included this in a wider review of how we uh, help those in training to carry out work necessarily to complete portfolios in stage two, and support qualified staff maintain their competencies particularly in the areas such as food, feed, weights and measures and safety. We've increased and broken down our inspection uh, sampling um, programmes into themes to ensure that officers with training and CPD requirements have the opportunity to undertake that work and that supports their learning uh, or maintaining their competency. Uh, now I appreciate uh, that in Lincolnshire we're in a more fortunate position than some other authorities we are relatively large compared to some and even though 25% of our frontline staff are working towards professional qualification at one stage or another, uh, we can still offer a good level of support. We also have a training budget which we can utilise to support their development and to help others maintain their competency. In this privileged position I'm also aware that we may eventually lose some of those officers to other authorities particularly those with career aspirations as team leaders and beyond. Uh, and I'm relatively comfortable with this as it will only provide further opportunities to bring in new people. The introduction of new blood into my service has been nothing but positive. Uh, the recruits bring a level of enthusiasm and willingness to learn that I haven't experienced personally for a number of years. Uh, and it's infectious. It's spread uh, to others in the service who want to get involved uh, want to go out and be part of their training and development. We're recruiting again at the moment uh, and the new level one, uh, the new level six TSO post um, should come online about the same time as they are looking uh, to join us in the new year. We'll certainly be making use uh, of the apprenticeship again uh, and we're hoping that the level six training standards officer qualification uh, will be up and running and we can see some course content and how that maps into the professional qualification uh, to around uh, the same time as we're thinking of, of starting them on that path. I said earlier that we've had no dropouts among our recent appointments. I believe that's uh, because we, we, we have this clearly defined career development path um, that we shared with them from the outset. Uh, and measures that we've put in place uh, to support them to help them achieve that, particularly in those early stages. Um, the pandemic was a particularly difficult time uh, for everyone and, and to, to come into the service uh, and to, to complete that RCO apprenticeship under those circumstances uh, is, is, is very commendable on their behalf. As this session is uh, aimed at apprenticeships, uh, I'm steering away from stage two of the professional qualification, uh, but I would just say to training standards colleagues, don't underestimate the level of commitment that's required. Uh, the principles we adopted uh, for the RCO and stage one uh, have been carried through to stage two, and to date we have not lost anyone, but it has been a, a fairly difficult journey so far. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel uh, and we're hoping uh, that uh, this time next year we'll, we'll be celebrating the success for those candidates uh, that, uh, that, uh, that are undertaking stage two now. Um, that's me done. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mark. That 
really inspirational about how trainees can invigorate the department and, and the fact you're looking to get more is brilliant. Um, sorry to scare you before, Helen, and we're now going to move to Helen Picton, who's the operational manager um, of the shared regulatory service in Bridge End, Cardiff. Um, so if you'd like to tell us about your experiences in Wales. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, just, just by way of introduction, um, I'm Helen Picton. Uh, I'm the Head of Shared Regulatory Services for Bridgend, Cardiff and the Vale of Glamorgan Councils. Um, for the four years up until uh, April of this year, I chaired Trading Standards Wales, hence the uh, the logo that you'll see on, on, on the slide. Um, and my journey really uh, in trying to um, secure a regulatory apprenticeship for Wales began uh, at that point in that role. Uh, with Trading Standards Wales and since uh, appointment into my current role uh, I now sit on um, the Directors of Public Protection Wales group and let's just say the journey continues but uh, all will be revealed. That is amazing how I can click a cursor and, and, and the slide changes, that, that's great. So I wanted to start with a little bit of um, background um, to this story um, and looking at the trading standards profession in Wales, which, which is where this journey started. Um, and a lot of this will chime with um, a lot of the content uh, in the earlier session, um, the turning point, tipping point uh, debate. Um, an ageing workforce, absolutely, uh, trading standards in Wales. This was a, a snapshot survey undertaken last year. Um, and the figures speak for themselves. So we've got 7% uh, of the profession at that point um, were under the age of 30. And then in sharp contrast, 31% were over the age of 50 and 17% over the age of 55. And then just to show that imbalance in, in even sharper um, contrast, only 3% of those um, uh, surveyed had joined the profession uh, in the previous year. Now, I'm conscious that is 2021 statistics, um, things um, I'm sure won't have uh, improved. And if anything, they probably will have, have got worse. Um, we have lost the uh, Trading Standards degree course, again, something which was which was uh, discussed in the previous session. Um, and as a result of that, um, th there wasn't always a, a clearly defined career pathway through to becoming a Trading Standards Officer. And that really impacted, I think, on our visibility as a career choice. And again, this chimes with the discussion earlier about increasing that visibility to young people, but also to uh, anyone of any age group uh, who would like to have um, a career change. So pretty much a perfect storm um, brewing of um, ageing workforce, um, difficulty in attracting um, people into trading standards as, as a, a career. Meanwhile, in England, um, successful um, level four regulatory compliance officer apprenticeship um, after a number of years through the, the, the trailblazer work, uh, that was launched in 2018. And of course, that provides uh, this wonderful pathway um, with exemptions into the um, Chartered Trading Standards Institute qualifications framework. And of course, as we've heard earlier, um, development of the level six trading standards apprenticeship uh, has also um, been underway and, and is due for um, going live very, very soon. So that was a picture in England. And back in 2018, 2019, I very naively thought that we could just pick up the RCO apprenticeship for England and drop it into Wales and we would be up and running. Um, and as I've said there, if only it had been that simple. So just to explain what the differences are in Wales in terms of the apprenticeship landscape. Um, there are different funding arrangements. So organisations um, with a, a payroll over £3 million, whatever the, the cutoff is now, um, pay the apprenticeship levy in the same way as they would in England 
but the, the way that funding is used is different in Wales. So I believe in England there are voucher schemes and um, some sort of uh, control by, by employers over the way that um, the, the levy is used. That doesn't apply uh, in Wales. It, it is um, a central funding. Clearly, there are different priority sectors and investment goals in Wales, and Welsh Government is very keen that those are reflected uh, in the apprenticeship framework here. And just touching again on that um, apprenticeship structure, the, the different structure in Wales, there is a, a qualification requirement. So at the heart of every apprenticeship in Wales, there has to be a qualification, um, which uh, is overseen by Qualifications Wales, rather than um, the endpoint assessment arrangement, uh, which applies in England. So where we came in on this journey in, in 2019, when we were looking enviously uh, at the, um, the English uh, apprenticeship, RCO apprenticeship, um, there were over 200 different um, apprenticeship frameworks in Wales. 80% uh, of apprentices were on just 20 of those frameworks. The remaining 20% were on 100 frameworks, and that meant that there were around 100 that weren't actually in use. So it was a very good time for us to come in. Uh, Welsh Government was starting to look at what was available, what was on offer, um, and to streamline um, the, the apprenticeship structures in Wales. So we, we came in at a good point. The frightener, I guess, for us, as, as it would have been for the, um, the RCO apprenticeship originally, is this requirement or the ask that there's an annual cohort of 50 plus uh, students, which for a, a smaller nation is, is probably uh, quite, quite a big ask. So progress to date, um, as I say, we've, we've been in discussion with Welsh Government since 2019, seeking development of a level four RCO type apprenticeship for Wales. Uh, in July 21, um, Trading Standards Wales and Chartered Institute of Environmental Health Wales submitted a detailed business case to Welsh Government, which was required. So we've been having discussions uh, and then um, things had moved on and uh, a business case was needed. So that was submitted in the summer of 21. Moving on to the autumn uh, of 2021, uh, we were asked to provide local authority cohort projections, um, which we submitted to Welsh Government. And those uh, cohort projections um, took in the uh, level of support for uh, environmental health, trading standards and licensing um, in supporting apprentices. And that was a three year projection that we were asked to do. So that was submitted. I think um, a catalyst really in this whole journey for us uh, began um, uh, probably this time last year with the creation by Directors of Public Protection Wales uh, of their Building for the Future paper. Uh, and, and this was a, a really important piece of work on the back of, of all the hard work during the, the pandemic. Um, to really try and build some resilience into public protection services across Wales. And that was endorsed by the Welsh Local Government Association and presented to council leaders in January of, uh, of this year. Then in April of this year, Building for the Future was presented to Welsh Government and the Minister for Finance and Local Government um, asked for some of the recommendations within the report um, to be progressed. So officials, um, Welsh Government officials and wider stakeholders were asked to identify the actions required to improve resilience of the public protection workforce for the future and that will be reported back um, and uh, development of a level four regulatory compliance officer type apprenticeship for Wales. So this was a real catalyst for us and at this point I got out the bunting because this really was um, a step in the right direction. And then moving on from there, um, in August of this year, Qualifications Wales uh, sought expressions of interest from awarding bodies for um, a regulatory compliance officer type apprenticeship in Wales. And three expressions of interest have been received. 
We've also been heavily involved in the creation of a steering group um, for development of the um, apprenticeship framework. Um, and as you'll see there, that represents uh, various bodies uh, across Wales, including Welsh Government, Qualifications Wales, um, the awarding body, once that is confirmed, um, professional bodies, employers, uh, training providers, um, learning and development colleagues uh, from local authorities in Wales, and crucially, public sector representatives, because to get anything like those um, cohort numbers, we um, obviously will be hoping that uh, there'll be plenty of interest and uptake uh, from private sector organisations for this apprenticeship. And then next steps. So the development of the qualification, we're waiting for a meeting to be arranged um, for the, the, the first um, meeting of, of the steering group. Um, and then development of the qualification uh, can begin. Now, crucially, we want that to mirror as far as possible the RCO standard um, as it is in England. Um, and that, of course, is to ensure that those exemptions that are enjoyed in England uh, from the CTSI qualification uh, can be enjoyed um, by, by the um, Welsh apprentices too. Um, then the um, work of the steering group begins in developing uh, the draft apprenticeship framework, and that will be subject to a four-week public consultation. So there may be feedback from that consultation, which will need to be taken on board. Um, but the upshot will be that that will then come back for um, ultimately for ministerial sign off and for implementation. And we really look forward to that day and we can start planning um, to enjoy many of the benefits which, which Mark has just um, alluded to that uh, he, he's enjoyed uh, with the apprenticeship in in his local authority and then i guess we we're still playing catch up even when we have the rco apprenticeship um in in wales um and it's probably time then to start um work on looking at that level six trading standards apprenticeship so hopefully that is a, a quick run through so that you um can see what the position is in wales it has been uh, quite a journey. Uh, it continues to be a journey, uh, but I'm really hopeful that we will have um, some, some more progress very soon. Well, thank you very much for that, Helen. And we really look forward to seeing you putting the bunting out again soon when you get your level four and then your level six. So we move on now to um, Ian Simpson, who's the specialist trainer for the Regulatory Compliance Officer Apprenticeships at Babington. So, Ian. Am I able to hear? Yeah, we, we can hear you now, Ian, yes. way of introduction um yes i'm a specialist trainer for the regulatory compliance officer apprenticeship at uh, babington and i'm a ctsi member and a previous uh, chair of the board as, as well at ctsi um so yeah just a little bit um uh, about the rco i wanted to i suppose give some insights um into the rco at babington and how, how is it looking how is it going um offer um some some opportunities i think that there are um, for, for, for the qualification and, and working in partnership. That's been a theme of this morning, the collaboration. Um, so working in, in collaboration with others uh, to, to help that. But also some challenges and, and, and accepting there are some challenges as well. So I just want to sort of put those out there as well. OK, so, um, yeah, um, addressing the skills shortage. That was the sort of the, the topic of, of, of what we're talking about today. And, um, you know, some very positives to start with. The student numbers are exceeding expectations. I mean, Babington have been very pleased with the, the numbers of students, apprentices, your, your apprentices coming forward uh, to us. Um, and I think, um, you know, listening to what Helen just said there about the private sector as well as the regulated uh, sector um that you know it's it's uh, it was it, all credit to phil owen to be honest and rob taylor who helped um uh, create the rco's uh, qualification that it does appeal to the public sector to local authorities and also national regulators and also to the private sector in that way 
um, it is much more of a sustainable qualification. And that's an important uh, point, I suppose, based on, on where we've had, you know, degree courses uh, get abandoned, I guess, over time and things like that, where numbers haven't been enough. So it's got to be economic in terms of a sustainable qualification. So the RCO looks like it is and it's doing well. Um, and um, actually, if anybody's out there wanting, we're, we're about to recruit a new RCO tutor at Babington because um, we're growing the course and we have need for another tutor now. So lots of positives about that. And what I do see is this, um, the talk in apprenticeships um, talks about transferable skills. And I'm really, really seeing that, that um, I suppose it's opened my eyes in, in, in being a tutor and having apprentices come from all sorts of um, regulatory sectors, national regulators, as well as throughout local government, because they, uh, in terms of local government regulators, we've got trading standards, we've got environmental health, we've got licensing, we've got housing, we've got planning. Um, and you do really do see that the skills we develop in these regulators are transferable between services and between the public and private sector. We, we, can, we can tutor um, uh, the apprentices, um, whether they're compliance officers working in the private sector. Um, or regulators in the public sector and um, the skills are the important thing the skill to risk assess the skill to inspect or audit the skill to um, communicate well with with those you're regulating or those you're helping to support so those skills um, are definitely transferable and we're seeing that that movement um, across um, uh, employers um, really good again in terms of the positive. It is working well with CTSI, the professional competency framework, the stage one exemption that's worked well. We've had a lot of our students um, then seek out that exemption. Um, and um, I've just got this poll topped up on my screen. I'm just going to get rid of that. Um, so, the um, yeah, that's working really well. We've got those students wanting it. We brief them on that exemption is in place and working well. And they're taking it up and they're succeeding. They're doing the trading sellers law paper and they're going on to get the whole of their stage one and going on to stage two as well. So really pleased that that's working well. And I, a little bit of bias from me, I have to say that I, I, I have a little bit of a trading standards bias. And I, I do encourage them. I'm probably that much more enthusiastic about the, uh, the trading standards side of things. So there we are. And um, what I'd say in terms of opportunities, um, that um, I listened to, to John Garforth earlier about the Institute of Licensing and the uh, more formal professional qualifications coming through from, from the Institute of Licensing. So it would be really great to work with John and the Institute uh, now in terms of looking at the recognition of prior learning from the RCO into um, the apprentices that want to go on and have a, a further career in, in, in licensing because license is working really well, the RCO with licensing. We have a lot of licensing officers across local authorities on the RCO and um, and we want to see, you know, that that could progress in terms of careers. And the same way with environmental health, because I've got um, uh, quite a few apprentices that have, have, have been in environmental health services. Uh, they've gone on and wanted to then do the degree course in environmental health. And I've had to say to them, well, you'll have to speak to um, the university who you're, you're appealing to, to um, see if they will recognize any prior learning from your RCO qualification. What would be good would be to mirror what we've got in place with CTSI and actually have a formal recognition of prior learning and exemption in place, uh, a pathway to go on to do um, perhaps a level six uh, qualification. And the same with housing, probably housing is not so rec re um, represented today, but we have a lot of housing enforcement officers on the course as well. And um, in that way, um, I think it strengthens um, for, for the employers, it strengthens for the course, it makes it more sustainable. So um, lots to think about there in terms of just you know, opportunities to to push it even further. Uh, then I just wanted to to share a little bit of um, um, of insight into the RCO. Um, so the figures here are based on I've got in the top corner there 184 of our learners. So most recent learners, and I've just been um, um, doing some statistics and looking at our, our books in terms of what we've got. So. Um, uh, whether this is a surprise to you or not, I don't know, but uh, it's an 80-20. We often talk about the 80-20 rule, don't we? So 80% of our apprentices um, come from regulators, regulatory authorities, and that split is 47% in local authorities and 33% in, in national, uh, retail, national regulators. So um, just to give you a flavour on that, um, um, local authorities, I say, you know, right across the board in terms of um, planning, environmental health, environmental protection, licensing, health and safety, housing, planning. 
Um, and then in national regulators, we've got um, uh, quite a part of the DEFRA group. So the uh, Animal Plant Health Agency, Environment Agency, Rural Payment Agency, um, Officer Rail and Road, um, uh, the Office for Product Safety and Standards, of course, they, they put a lot of a uh, lot of students our way. Ofqual have come in with some DVSA, the Civil Aviation Authority as well. So quite a lot of success with with um, apprentices coming in from national regulators. Thirty three percent of all our, our our apprentices are coming in from the national regulators now. And again, back to when this course was designed, I don't think that was uh, necessarily seen as to what it's, uh, it's 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 come through on. It's been really really good in the in the in the private sector. Um, uh, really, I think there's massive opportunity to grow it much more. I think the biggest sector we've got at the moment is education and health. And when you think of those sectors, they're huge. And uh, we've only got 20 percent of our, our apprentices in that sector, in the whole of the private sector. Um, so I don't think, you know, Babington, we could do a lot more in terms of marketing the course. We've, we've gone steady, steady over the last uh, coming up to four years now um in terms of marketing the course um of course it's new rco as a qualification is is new it's not like hr or or project management or leadership qualifications so it still needs to get established but i think it's turning that point we talk about tipping points turning points i think the recognition is is is, is now out there and the understanding is is more so so with a bit more marketing i think um Babbington sees that we could do we could we the, the course is very successful for, for the future um, I've just given a bit of statistics on the bottom there. I mean, we're we're very proud of, of the quality of what we do in terms of delivering the RCO. Um, 100% pass rate over the last uh, four years. Um, we're, we're achieving around 80% distinction levels and um, our qualification achievement rate is up around 76% for two years running. Now, I will mention a little bit more about that qualification achievement rate because that's that's um, that covers into those that um, don't finish the course. And the issue about um, skills uh, and development is about retention, as well as recruiting apprentices, we need to retain them. And it was really good to, to hear Mark a minute ago in Lincolnshire talking about the success he's had there in Lincolnshire with retaining uh, their apprentices and into career grades. And I think, you know, there's some messages and lessons learned uh, from, from what the good work that Lincolnshire have done, but it's not the same everywhere. If you've seen uh, a national report come out this week, um, the, the achievement uh, rates, which means really those the dropout rates, you could call it in terms of a negative, is, is nationally around 50%. It's really, it is really poor. We have an issue nationally on retention, um, on, on completing courses on apprenticeship. So in Babington with the RCO, we're good. That's well above average, the 76%. We're proud of that. But uh, we are seeing um, um, some leave the, leave the course. And if I give you one tale, um, one of our apprentices just left and um, uh, a pay, I'd say, is the pay was a thing. And we talk about the cost of living crisis. She's, she's ditched the RCO apprenticeship she was on and become a cleaner because she can earn more money. And I just thought that's so, so sad. The employer there, um, they couldn't uh, do anything for her at the time, but she's left a professional qualification apprenticeship. She could have done well with it. She's gone to become a cleaner because she needs the money now. So pay is a very real issue in terms of um, that retention rate as well. Let me give you a little bit more in terms of, of uh, insights here, because again, this might link to what we heard from John Herriman this morning in terms of uh, CTSI. Um, um, CTSI are very keen to um, diversify um, the population of its membership and look at uh, male, female, look at age profile, the aging population as well uh, within local services. So um, a very good, um, and I didn't know this until I ran the statistics this last week, actually. Um, we've, so, we've shown on our, our apprentices coming to us, and they're coming to us from you, um, the employers, um, a growth in ethnic minorities from 11% to 22%. Now, um, I've got um, a little, probably a little bit more breakdown in terms of um, uh, the numbers there. We do, we do look at um, breakdown Asian uh, Asian British is the largest group in terms of ethnic minorities. We then go to Black African Caribbean and Black British is the next uh, uh, group. But overall, it's showing some positive trend there. Just over two years, doubled from 11% to 22% of our apprentices are, are classify themselves as ethnic minorities. So, so a good news if that uh, continues. And um, we're up around um, probably 22% is where we should be um, in terms of employers' uh, employment and coming through to... Um, to, to apprenticeships on, on a course. The male-female ratio, 60% um, uh, quite consistently over the last three years, female. 
And if I just go back to when I was a trainee and apprentice and I was trying to think back, I don't have the numbers, but as far as I can recall, it was 0% ethnic minorities on the court I was on in the 1980s, early 1980s, I think 40 years ago now. So it is going back a little bit. Male, female, I would have said estimate at 25 to 30% female back in the early 80s in terms of the course I was on, the DTS at Western Supermare. Um, so again, a real shift and we are seeing a consistent um, high number, a higher number of, of female apprentices um, coming through to us. So matter of fact, that that's what's coming through. Age profile, I would like to give a little bit more here. And I, I'm going to ask our guys if they can break down the the the, the range um, above 23, because if you can see it on the slides there, uh, quite a low number at the 16 to 18 age group for this course. It is a level four course. So we, we are talking about probationary degree level. So you'd expect um, a low number at the 16 to 18. So we have a few 18 year olds. That's that's where it is, actually. Um, but not that many in the 19 to 23. The majority are over 24. What I'd like to do is break that down and know a little bit for my own sake about this. But I know on the course we have um, um, uh, 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 apprentices that are in their mid 50s and, and everything in between. And what is really good to see is the, the course um, doing well for um, people coming in as new apprentices, new recruits but also skilling up existing workforce. So a lot of you are doing that as well. And we see the value of, of those guys that um, perhaps didn't do well at school. They've been blocked in their careers and um, because they didn't have GCSEs, because they didn't have a professional qualification and the RCO has opened up opportunities for them. And I can tell stories of, of single parents, um, you know, really wanting a qualification and this has given them that and they're so enthusiastic now to have a career path in front of them. And, you know, um, those in their 50s saying, you know, I'm not I'm not looking to retirement. I'm looking to maybe career change and actually develop my skills and do a qualification. So all credit to them. That's some. So lots of positive, but I just thought I'd share some insights there uh, for you all in terms of the profile. Um, some challenges. I, I said I'd mentioned some challenges. So, you know, one of the things that is about social mobility and, um, uh, and, and the RCO and apprenticeships generally providing an alternative to full-time university courses. As we know, there are degree apprenticeships now, and we heard that there are some for um, environmental health already. And, um, and it could well be that the level six um, TS uh, apprenticeship um, is delivered by universities and becomes a, de a, a degree apprenticeship there as well. So it, it is providing an alternative and it, 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 it gives some money, obviously, to, to those. And, you know, I'm really bought into apprenticeships, you know, in terms of the style of on, you know, learning on the job, getting some tuition, getting feedback, that virtuous loop of getting some knowledge, um, shadowing some officers in the workplace, then having a go themselves, getting feedback from their colleagues at work, getting feedback and help from training providers like Babington in terms of on the course as well, um, leading to that confidence, because it's so powerful to see the confidence in the young people, not all young people, but the apprentices um, coming through. Their confidence grows and their competence goes with it, of course. So, um, but there's a but, I've given a little but there, haven't I? And I've said about challenges. Well, what we do see to be, to be very honest, is that we will um, support um, students coming through that don't have functional skills in maths and English, level two GCSEs, um, onto the course. They have to have those in place before they're allowed to sit their exams. But I do say, just from experience, it is quite tough to do a level four course as well as go back, if you like, and do their functional skills at maths and English. So as employers, I think I'd have to say, you know, if you can get them to be to have at least their GCSEs, possibly A-levels or level three qualifications before they come on a level four course. I think that's the normal route. Universities typically would say, you know, you wouldn't go on to a university course without GCSEs and, and perhaps A-levels or level three qualification. Staff retention. Now, I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier, you know, as well as recruiting and some of the recruiting is going well into apprenticeships. Uh, you, we do have an, uh, uh, an aging workforce, but the, we also have an agile workforce, which is good. You know, people can move around. We have low unemployment, but there is a, a risk that you're losing um, your, your apprenticeship graduates. Um, some of it is low pay. The I, You know, I have to challenge. We've got some apprentices on six pound 40 an hour. Uh, the 19 year olds, they, 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 you know, there is they are low pay. You know, is that right? And they're like the one I said has gone off to be a cleaner. Um, so they have transferable skills and they could go and work elsewhere. So 
your policies working with training providers like Badman and thinking about retention, I think is an important issue and a challenge for us. The other sort of final sort of um, point I was going to make, and, and then I finish, um, I suppose it's just um, a heads up to me. I think perhaps being in senior leadership roles and in, in, in doing management consultancy for something like 20 years, um, I've been in a bit of a bubble, I have to say. And what has occurred to me and seen in, in, in truth is the level of apprentices with autism, with dyslexia, uh, their mental well-being is not so good. Working from home, just as a simple thing, how things have changed since COVID, that doesn't suit a lot of, I would say it's the younger apprentices. It doesn't suit them. They're not in the office. They're not overhearing conversations. Um, they're struggling from a requirement to sometimes work from home. So I think that's a challenge uh, for employers as well. So um, that's it. Um, thanks uh, very much for that. Uh, and, and back, back to Yvonne. OK, thank you very much indeed, uh, Ian. And finally, let's move to Mark Buckley, who's Head of Sales Credit Services Association. And he's an alternative provider of the RCO scheme. Uh, good, af uh, good, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I lost track of time there. I do apologise. Um, I'll keep our section brief, um, as I appreciate we're quite short on time. So it's just with regards to, I've got some slides, hopefully. Um, just bear with me one second. Um, how do I come out of this? I've just clicked something and can't come out of it. Um, what I'm going to be looking at is the, there we go, uh, Going to look at some observations of the level four RCO, and then I'm going to do very similar to what Ian's just done for Babington um, and look at numbers and figures and how we can work together with the local authorities as well. So to begin with, the observations of the level four RCO apprenticeship that we've seen over the delivery since September 2018 is that we've had consistent numbers over that period of time. And there's been a lot of local authorities coming back to us uh, for additional apprentices um, once um, Previous, previous learners have completed, or while some other learners are still on cohorts. Um, it does vary. Um, there's no one particular method um, that would fit every uh, local authority or employer, um, but we're quite happy to discuss and work with um, employers to find out what would best fit for them. Um, the apprenticeships, as well, we found are very good at being used alongside other training and quals. Um, the sort of the qualification aspect looks at is teaching people from a different perspective as what the apprenticeships are. Apprenticeships is more sort of on the job, learning from the practical perspective, as well as helping with the theoretical. And obviously learning with the theoretical, it can complement the other qualifications that are coming at it from that perspective as well. The delivery of the RCO, we, we come at it from a very experienced and flexible perspective. Our tutors are very well ingrained in regulatory compliance, training standards, risk, uh, and come from decades worth of experience in that background. And our flexible delivery approach, although there is a standard to work to, we can work around that, look at working with the individual and the employer on open courts, getting to understand that individual's job role fully so we can incorporate the standard into their apprenticeships and help develop them that perspective. The closed cohorts, we can tailor it a little bit more. We can incorporate a lot more training from you as an employer to make it a bit more specific to your requirements. So there's... As I say, there's still a standard that we have to deliver, but we can incorporate a bit more exclusively to yourselves. That would have to be a closed cohort, because obviously if you're in an open cohort, you'd be looking at stuff that some other uh, learners may not require. Um, I know Andy Pollard uh, just put up a question with regards to face-to-face. -face. Closed cohorts now, um, if people do have them, we can deliver those face-to-face. -face. We have just started delivering a closed cohort for NETSA um, in the last couple of months. Um, because that was their requirement. If, depending on how many inquiries we get from a certain geographical area, we can look at doing that as well, if people are working closely together. Uh, the one benefit that we've seen, or well, one of the many benefits we've seen from the open codes and delivering things online, um, is that it allows people to start a lot quicker. You can get people from different parts of the country. So again, it's just balancing that out, but we are more than happy to discuss those with you at the CSA. Um, and also, your question, Virginia, is that it is the apprenticeship is part of your working week. 
Um, hopefully the online delivery bit I've just mentioned there helps address that aspect. Um, and it's meant for anyone. It's not just young people. As long as it's people coming into the industry who've got no experience, if it's people who have got limited experience um, within the within their field and wanting to grow and develop their knowledge and skills, that's the idea of an apprenticeship. It's, it's meant for everyone as l subject to the requirements, obviously. The good thing about the level four RCO now as well is that it can it links into the level six TS apprenticeship, uh, which we're hopefully looking at delivering in early 2023. We're finalizing the delivery plan uh, as we speak and hope to have that uh, finished before the end of the year. Um, and also the level four, it look, works closely with different areas. I'll come to that a bit later on. I know Ian mentioned it um, in part of his presentation as well. Um, the We look at pastoral care element of delivering the apprenticeship as well. We want to ensure that the learner and employer are fully supported throughout the duration of the apprenticeship. We still want to stretch them and make it and help them develop the knowledge. We don't want to make it an easy ride for anyone, but we, we do want to ensure that people stay there, get full understanding. The employer knows fully what they're doing, how they can work together with that. And by doing that, that does also help with the staff retention as well. That has been mentioned before. So we found that, um, our retention rates on this apprenticeship are quite high, and I'll come to those um, now. So, oh yes, it has worked. So briefly, there's been, since we delivered, we've had about 320 learners, over 107 different employers across that, of which 79 have been local or public sector employers. So you're looking about a pushing 75, 80, 20 split, uh, similar, to, similar to Ian's figures before. Uh, and as Ian mentioned as well, the national average for achievement and retention rates is, is not very high. It's around about 50 odd percent, as you can see there. Our achievement rates on the level four are much, much higher than that. You're looking in mid eighties for the level four RCO on the achievement rates. We're looking at hundred percent for the pass rates, um, which incorporates past merits and distinctions. Um, and the retention rates is around about 85% as well. I won't repeat what Ian's mentioned about how retention rates are equated and achievement rates are equated because you've already heard that. But as, it, as you say, with regards to level four, because of the pastoral care, because of the working closer with the employer and the learner, it we found that people stay to complete the apprenticeship and then stay on afterwards. We've Yes, you will get some attritional rates afterwards, but we do find that through apprenticeships, you have that loyalty from learners as well, and they do tend to stay. Um, not in every case, but they do tend to stay. The, the apprenticeship covers lots of areas. These are just a brief highlight of them. It's obviously trading standards, mental health, main ones. There's other things I can add on there um, that come from the private sector. But if there's a regulatory compliance requirement within someone's role, we can look at incorporating this apprenticeship for you. There's not just necessarily for trading standards. So additional support elements as well. Um, it's been referenced before with regards to functional skills. I think Mark mentioned that there were the specified maths, uh, English and science, GCSE. Uh, the only requirements for definite are maths and English GCSE grades A to C or four to nine. Obviously, if there's no level as well, depending on how old you are. Um, if you don't have that requirement, we can help provide that tutoring. We have a 96% first time pass rate for the functional skills. You're not going to be sitting at GCSE again. You're going to be, <laughs> you're not going to be doing a two year exam or two year course. I mean, we only deliver the apprenticeship over 60 months. So that'd be nigh impossible. Um, but we do look at assessments and we, we work with you across it. As mentioned before, the pastoral care. We also look at full safeguarding provision for the individuals. People have had an awful, uh, last two, two to two and a half years because of the pandemic and cost of living crisis and everything else that's been happening most recently. We will ensure that people get the full support, have access to everything that they need that we can provide as a training provider uh, to ensure that they've got the support, they're not stressed, they're not anxious, they're not put past their comfort zones. Mm -hmm. It's there. There's also the full access to the tutors and coaches. It's not just there at the workshops and one-to-ones. If they have questions, they can ring or email at any time. There's also support from head office as well. Um, we also encourage full collaboration amongst the cohorts themselves to help people support them through the apprenticeships. People will be coming at things from different perspectives. So people may be worrying and just going, no, people asking different questions of um, to look at different perspectives and different angles that can help incorporate them in there. So there's the full support from that. We actively encourage that collaboration. Um, as I say, there's mentioned the support to the employer, line manager and mentor. 
there's dedicated contract managers um, for individual companies as well. So it's it's the full caboodle. It's not just a learner. If you have to look at the employers as well, because if the employers aren't supported, things potentially will go um, down slightly and the retention could be affected in that perspective. And then, as I mentioned before, all tutors and coaches are immensely experienced within the regulatory and compliance area. That concludes my brief um, presentation for yourselves. I say I was quite conscious of time, um, but we're more than happy to answer any questions. Um, hopefully the slides will be the will be available to people. As, as Nazir's put there, having a job at the RCOs is not always guaranteed, um, but we do see an awful lot of retention, I did mention. So it's, but we're quite happy to discuss that in more depth. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mark. I think Virginia has got Virginia Taylor's got a couple of questions. One of which I think you have almost answered about whether yeah. the employer has to guarantee what job they get um, at the end. And also, can you do the RCO course online as well as doing a full time job, as, or is it meant for younger people? Really, um, it's. It I think, as I mentioned, it's not. It's for anyone. The apprentice, anyone can do an apprenticeship. It's not just for young people. Um, it depends on the delivery aspect as well. I'm certain Ian will probably vouch for this as well. Is that a lot of the delivery of the apprenticeship is online, but it's during your working week um, as, as part of your job to look at developing the knowledge and skills. Um, if there's potential for a face-to-face -face cohort in the geographical area that Virginia is based in, um, then that could also potentially be there, but all workshops are scheduled well before the cohort starts. So everyone would know exactly when they would need to be participating in those workshops, be it online or face-to-face. -face. Yeah, Ian, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, just um, we would um, we were doing face-to-face -face, uh, workshops pre-pandemic. We went online, we've stayed online, but with uh, closed cohorts and a geography now, I used to I used to do run run workshops in Wigan very regularly, Yvonne, for the Northwest cohorts uh, before the before the pandemic. So we would go back and do that, but we just need to recruit a cohort that is geographically based, so they're not having to travel a long way. So we can do that, and especially a closed co cohort, we'd look at doing some of those again now. Well, thank you very much for that. I just have a couple of results from the polls and we're saying there's a really good support for embracing an RCO apprenticeship scheme, tackling the issue of the ageing workforce. 72% think that that is a really good way uh, in doing that. So obviously we're doing something right and good luck with it, Helen to retain your staff as well. But uh, can I thank everyone from all the sessions for speaking. It's now time to break for lunch. And I'm going to hand over the reins to Duncan Stevenson, Director of Policy at Public Affairs at CTSI, as I've got another appointment this afternoon. But I do hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. The comments have been really valuable in the chat. I think it's really good to get the contacts and people getting to know each other again and working together, which we lost a lot during the pandemic. And good luck to all in the session. And don't forget, make a noise about what you're doing and tell your elected members, whether it be MPs or councillors, what you are doing and how valuable you are, because the public won't realise what they've got till it's gone and we don't want it to go. Thank you very much indeed for the time.
So do you want to just tell me initially just why you wanted to do that apprenticeship in the first place? The whole opportunity to learn on the job and gain a professional qualification whilst doing so greatly appealed to me. I previously did work in compliance and did actually quite enjoy doing that. When you sort of took on board the apprenticeship, why did you sort of want to do one? I felt like, I suppose, in my previous role, I've, I've been working for 10 years and I'd learned a lot over that time, but I felt like I was kind of stagnant. And seeing that, you know, CSA were doing um, the regulatory compliance officer apprenticeship, and I thought, oh, that sounds really interesting. And how do you think it's benefited you so far? Uh, well, without a doubt, it definitely has benefited uh, because since completing the qualification in July 2020, right, I've yes. since progressed in the company, thank yes. you, since progressed in the company to take on a team leader role. What's it been like working alongside a sort of specialist tutor? I thought it was going to be really difficult to understand certain things, but it's not. You know, the tutors are really helpful, um, they really make it, you know, that I can understand what's type of happening and, and what I'm learning. Any particular skills and then behaviours you think you've picked up from that you didn't have before doing the apprenticeship that you might have now? Definitely I'm a lot more confident in terms of myself, in terms of um, like what to do, what to look out for yeah. and all that. Would you recommend other people do this then? Would you think it's a good way of developing careers and as an individual and as a person? I think it really is important, yeah. It's, it's a great way to develop a career. It's kind of a starting kind of a starting point if you want to do something new or develop something that you've learned previously, definitely.
So do you want to just tell me initially just why you wanted to do that apprenticeship in the first place? The whole opportunity to learn on the job and gain a professional qualification whilst doing so greatly appealed to me. I previously did work in compliance and I did actually quite enjoy doing that. When you sort of took on board the apprenticeship, why did you sort of want to do one? I felt like, I suppose in my previous role I've, I've been working for 10 years and I'd learned a lot over that time but I felt like I was kind of stagnant and seeing that, you know, CSA were doing um, the regulatory compliance officer apprenticeship and I thought, oh, that sounds really interesting. And how do you think it's benefited you so far? Uh, well, without a doubt it definitely has benefited uh, because since completing the qualification in July 2020, right, I've yes. since progressed in the company, thank yes. you, since progressed in the company to take on a team leader role. What's it been like working alongside a sort of specialist tutor? I thought it was going to be really difficult to understand certain things, but it's not. You know, the tutors are really helpful. Um, they really make it, you know, that I can understand what's type of happening and, and what I'm learning. Any particular skills and then behaviours you think you've picked up from that you didn't have before doing the apprenticeship that you might have now? Definitely I'm a lot more confident in terms of myself, in terms of um, like what to do, what to look out for yeah. and all that. Would you recommend other people do this then? Would you think it's a good way of developing careers and as an individual and as a person? I think it really is important, yeah. It's, it's a great way to develop a career. It's kind of a starting kind of a starting point if you want to do something new or develop something that you've learned previously, definitely.
Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome back to uh, the year ahead. Um, so my name is Duncan Stevenson, and I'm Director of Policy and External Affairs at uh, the Chartered Trading Standards Institute. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Avon Favage MP for facilitating this morning's sessions. And there were some really good discussions setting the scene on the regulatory environment, uh, looking at some of our workforce challenges, but also the opportunities presented uh, by apprenticeships. Now for the remaining two sessions in today's year ahead, um, we're gonna focus in and hone in on particular areas of concern or particular issues. Um, and the first one is product safety. Um, and product safety is such a paramount issue um, indeed, uh, CTSI recently conducted a member survey and it was identified as one of the most important policy issues for us. So we're delighted to uh, welcome uh, Sarah Smith, who is Deputy Chief Exec at the Office Product Safety and Standards. Sarah leads the UK government's approach to regulation and market surveillance for product safety and legal metrology, amongst other things and is also responsible for OPSS's engagement and accountability with businesses and local authorities. So Sarah was a TS professional working in a variety of leadership roles. Um, so Sarah, you are very welcome and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Duncan. And it's uh, great to join colleagues um, in the virtual year ahead. Um, I've attended many of these um, over the years in all sorts of places, but it's um, it's really great to be with you today and to talk to you a little bit um, about what we're up to at the Office of Product Safety and Standards um, and to, to tell you a little bit about some more of the activities and work priorities um, that we have. So you're very welcome to 1 Victoria Street. I know it looks like I'm in a cupboard and the office that I'm in is is very cupboard-like, um, but I'm sure you're all enjoying uh, better surroundings. So um, let's get started. So I've got, I've got 20 minutes or so and probably want to leave some time um, for questions too. So um, I'm going to talk to you today really about how we protect people and places through the work that we do through our policy and delivery um, on product safety and legal metrology. Um, and, and that protecting people and places really sits absolutely at the heart of the outcomes that we're trying to achieve and um, that we often work together with you on um, in local government. Can I have the next slide please? So in terms of that, um, it's actually it's five years since the Office for Product Safety and Standards was set up back in in, in 2018. Um, and what are things have happened um, during that time, whether it's the UK leaving the European Union, um, dealing with a global pandemic, um, but also the kind of pace of change in terms of the products that we buy and the way that we buy them. Um, so it's a timely moment for us to, to think about what does, what does that five years tell us and, and what lies ahead for the next period? And we've just recently published our new um, strategy. Um, and for this time, um, it's a, a product regulation strategy. It's not just about, um, just about sorry, a product, yes, a product regulation strategy, not a product safety strategy. And that, that's quite a significant um, thing. But absolutely at the heart of that, we have these two um, outcomes that we're trying to deliver, keeping consumers safe, but also supporting business, businesses to innovate and grow. Can I have the next slide, please? So what is our remit and what, sorry, can you go, go back one? Yeah, so what is our remit? Um, we are the UK's product regulator um, and we're responsible for the regulation of most consumer goods. Um, so if you don't eat it, you don't drive it and you don't take it as a medicine, um, largely um, we look after the regulation um, of those products. And many of you will be aware that um, at the beginning of last year, we took on responsibility for also being the national regulator for construction products as part of the government's reforms to the building safety infrastructure. 
So as well as being a regulator, we also are in the very fortunate position that we hold policy responsibility for product safety, legal metrology, standards and accreditation, hallmarking and primary authority. So that enables us to not, not just think about the delivery of the regulation, but also the regulations themselves. And we also deliver um, enforcement of a, a wide range of other um, responsibilities um, through the product life cycle. So thinking holistically about how products are regulated and always trying to join those um, things up and make the experience for business about complying with the law as simple as possible so that they can focus on the safety outcomes that are very important from a both a um, safety and environmental perspective perspective. So that concept of seeing products through through the life cycle and thinking about where to intervene to deliver those um, good outcomes. So can I have the next slide, please? And again, just thinking about that in terms of regulating through the product life cycle, increasingly we're seeing the coming together um, of safety, environmental and more recently um, uh, security requirements around cyber activities related to products and where can we intervene so obviously um, trying to be upstream thinking about where good product design can deliver um, good safety and, and good outcomes from from the very beginning but also about product approval so for many products before they can be placed on the market there needs to be um, uh, assurance that, that, that they comply with the standards and regulations and that we can have confidence in the way that those products are tested and placed on the market. So again, thinking about the oversight of that standards and accreditation systems. We also work on product origin as well. So thinking about legal controls in the trade of raw materials. So things like um, uh, assets and benefits sharing, um, thinking about timber regulation, and also um, there's some new proposals coming down the track as well around forest risk commodities. So thinking about product origin and making sure that they're not, you know, products are not impacting in the environment, not just here in the UK, but also in, in the wider world and how we meet our um, trade obligations in respect of those, those issues. So thinking about product integrity um, as well. So, so our weights and measures controls are about um, ensuring the accuracy of weight measure, but also the metered supply of things like gas and electric. And um, more recently, um, around vehicle charging. importance as we think about cost of living and people wanting assurance that they're getting what they pay for. So a really um, important thing there about thinking about product integrity. And then moving on to, to product safety. So, you know, making sure that products that consumers use and particularly consumers that have vulnerabilities, um, that they're protected, that, that they have safe products to use in their everyday lives and that those products are going to perform um, as expected. And then again, when we think about end of life, you know, we think about product disposable, product disposal, making sure again that those environmental impacts are managed um, through through safe disposal methods, whether that's on um, electrical goods, whether it's on batteries, um, whether it's on securing things like right to repair um, and all those kind of important topics as we think more about recycling and reuse rather than just um, disposal. So again, it's about thinking holistically about as a product regulator about how we how we exercise controls th through the life cycle. Can I have the next slide, please? So I wanted to just um, touch on three topics um, that are significant for us at the moment, and I'm sure for you. So we're in the middle of a fundamental review of the product safety framework um, about where obligations are placed, about how we think about regulation and enforcement, about how we make sure it's fit for purpose, not just for tomorrow, but for the next 30 years. So a really exciting opportunity to think, um, you know, for the long term about what does our product safety framework need to look like. And then perhaps bringing that a little bit more um, into today, thinking about how do we regulate online marketplaces? Um, again, thinking about those new business models, thinking about what 
the responsibilities should look like um, between buyer and seller and other actors in the supply chain. And then finally, again, as um, practitioners, thinking about how do we think about product risk? How do we manage scarce resources? How, how do we make sure that we're evaluating risk in a, in a sensible way and thinking about um, you know, how, how we deliver safe outcomes through understanding hazard and risk? Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So the product safety review and the next one, please. Um, so we've got a bold ambition here. Um, so our ambition is about whether they're being regulated to protect people or protect the environment. Our ambition is for businesses to have a simple set of rules based on hazards presented by the product. Um, easy words to say, um, but you know that that is very much our ambition about seeing the regulation targeted on the things that potentially pose the most hazard to consumers and to the environment and also bringing together multiple outcomes so that there's no point having a set of rules that deliver really safe products if in turn they, they damage the environment or vice versa um, and again it's not about one or the other it's about making sure that we deliver those multiple outcomes through, an, through a single framework. Uh, next slide please. So what has our approach been? So if you've been following this, um, you'll know that we issued a call for evidence a number of years ago, inviting uh, views in relation to specific questions. Um, we participated in lots of one-to-one -one conversations and roundtable events, many of them involving um, you and colleagues. Um, we had a very wide range of contributors to that call for evidence from business, from, from you, from consumers and from consumer representative organisations. And what, what that enabled us to do was to build this strong picture of where the current framework was and where it was not working. Um, so we've been able to, you know, to, to build this um, approach from a really strong um, evidence approach that's been informed by all, of, all our stakeholders. Uh, and the next slide, please. So what did we hear? Um, we heard that the current system is well established and it's internationally recognised. Obviously, our time in the EU, much of it has come from um, the UK's um, membership of the European Union. Um, that there is a broad support for an outcomes based approach that allows businesses flexibility. So, you know, this idea about um, a lot of specificity in the programme was not something that was um, well supported by, um, by stakeholders. Um, there are things that highlight challenges and tensions in the current framework, which we can only expect to increase over time. The size and complexity of the framework cause difficulties, particularly for new businesses, innovative businesses and small businesses. Um, and if we think about the fact that there's over 2000 pages of product safety legislation on the stocks at the moment, it's no wonder that there is complexity. And many variations add to this complexity, um, providing lots of different legal definitions for things that are largely the same. Um, but also we had this um, idea that more could be done to better reflect the real life le levels of hazard and risk. So truly regulating the things that we need to regulate because of the hazard or risk that they present to cons consumers or the environment. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so again, this is probably obvious to all of you, the framework was not designed for online business models. Um, and I think it's creaking under the, the strain of that. Um, the traditional boundaries around the economic operators that we have, manufacturer, importer and distributor are becoming blurred by the supply chains that we have. Um, there's also a lack of clarity over responsibilities, which make it easier for unsafe and non-compliant products to be sold. Um, and we can't have that. That's clearly a very undesirable um, outcome. And there is alarm at the ease with which unsafe and non-compliant products um, can be sold through online marketplaces from overseas third parties. And we heard that loud and clear, many of that coming from, from colleagues in local government. Can I have the next slide, please? So we've set out an intention for fundamental reforms um, around these five areas. So e-commerce, we've got to clearly tackle that issue 
and clarify responsibilities in the online supply chains. We need to simplify it. 2,000 pages of statute cannot be the way forward. Um, we need the rules and responsibilities to be simpler and more coherent to help regulators and business. We need proportionality in the system. So making that you know, clearer distinction about why we're regulating and that more being clearly rooted in risk-based approaches. And also about how we think about digital to um, modernise the framework. So things like e-labelling, um, AI, how, how can these things be enabled um, to, to help us deliver outcomes? And then obviously enforcement, the thing that you're probably very interested in um, about making the new regime easier to follow and comply with, but also ensure it's got sufficient teeth, that you have the powers and responsibilities that you need to, to deliver the outcomes that we all want to see. So what's going to happen next? Um, we will be publishing a, a formal consultation um, in due course, um, and I very much hope that as you have done with all our other um, calls for evidence and interactions on this, that you play your part in, in letting us know your views and thoughts. Um, okay, I'm just conscious now of time. So if we move on to the, uh, the next slide, please just briefly talk a little bit about online marketplaces. Um, so it's clear that it's, there are, it's prevalent that there are dangerous products um, being sold. Um, our, our analysis is that we're most concerned about those products um, that look to target young children. So we've found, you know, toys, baby products. You'll have seen our product safety alert um, only this week um, about um, baby prop feeding devices clearly should not be on sale. Um, so what have we been doing? Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we've had a twofold approach. Um, We've been doing it the old fashioned way um, around using intelligence and market surveillance activity to tackle the most serious cases. So lots of test purchasing, lots of re requests for recalls and takedowns, enforcement, using notices, working with primary authorities, all of those kind of things that you would expect us to be doing. Um, and we've really upped the, upped the numbers and the, the ante on that. And also um, direct challenge to online marketplaces to act. Um, we've been working to understand their diverse business models, understand the relationships that they have with sellers and the, capa and the capabilities of their systems and internal procedures so that we can drive change in those markets and make sure that online marketplaces are playing their part in keeping consumers safe. So what do we know? Um, we know it's a growing trend, um, ac only accelerated by the recent pandemic. Um, we see a market for rapidly produced low cost products. And this has created an environment where producers are driven by price point and not by safety or compliance. Um, un there's unbranded reverse engineered copies of branded products that can present a very real risk. And these are clearly uh, uh, providing a challenge to online marketplaces, systems and processes. And the hot hairbrush um, uh, example from over the summer is, absolutely sits at the heart of that. Um, and we know that a lot of these high risk products are produced outside the UK and Europe. Um, and in terms of jurisdiction, very challenging. A lot of these businesses are importing um, these products and they don't have UK um, responsible economic operators. Okay, so what are we doing about, what, what do we know? So our surveillance programme, um, our, our stats tell us that 77% of the products that we purchased um, and evaluated were unsafe and non-compliant. Um, a quite staggering statistic. We did go looking, um, but still, um, still a shocking stat. So what we're hoping to do, uh, can I have the next slide? Um, so looking at increasing accountability, so keeping that pressure up through senior level dialogue. We've been asking them to focus on the relationship that they have with third party suppliers, um, requesting that they take proactive action about the safety of the products to give themselves assurance. Also that 
they have a role to play in providing good, clear information to consumers about how they can protect themselves. And also um, making sure that the data that online platforms are using is, you know, the best and up, most up to date about them keeping track of product recalls um, and delisting and making sure that they don't continue to appear. So quite a bit going on um, in that programme. Um, so complex, uh, you know, clearly a complex situation and we're very clear that the status quo cannot continue. That is sitting at the heart of the product safety um, review and the government is serious about tackling the issue um, and that's been made very clear to online marketplaces. So just in the last one minute, I'll, um, I won't go through the slides on product risk assessment methodology, PRISM, our new um, and shiny a risk assessment tool. We're really delighted to be working on this, to be working with colleagues in local government on it. Um, and we really think it is a step forward from RAPEX and will really enable us to, to get into focusing on risk and to have that more holistic approach to, to risk-based uh, methodologies. And we're going to have more to say and more all about PRISM um, over the coming months. And I hope you're going to be able to participate in the work um, on that as we start to, to roll that out and see the benefits of it. So I think I've had my time. Um, great to be with you today. And I think I'll hand it back over to Duncan. Thank you very much there, Sarah. That's that's great. R really, really good. And uh, uh, actually, staggering statistic there, 77% of products unsafe. That's in in incredible. Um, there, there is time if you've got a couple of minutes just for a couple of uh, respond to a couple of uh, questions that I've seen in the chat. So one is from the um, in relation to stats from the British Toy and Hobby Association and some concerns around toy safety online. And I think you touched on it, but how, how can you hold retailers accountable? What are your expectations? What are, what are the options? So I think the if we're holding retailers to account, I think it's easy. The law applies to them. They've got distributor responsibilities. Um, it's unacceptable. They have, you know, then they have the responsibility to be complying um, with the law. Um, we obviously we work very closely with British Toy and Hobby Association. We really value the work that they do in terms of their sweeps. They're bringing us of interest and also individual products so we work hand in glove with them um, on their surveillance in the same way as we do with local government and also um, uh, with electrical safety first so mm -hmm. we see our you know, you know all of that data and evidence that they're providing really gives us um, very positive thank you you, you just disappeared there but i think oh, that's sorry. i think that i think that's how i think we got the we got the, the the point there. Um, I think uh, Danny Danny Maxim has asked, uh, how do you reduce the risk of a disconnect? So you, you've got this great um, strategy here. How do you how do you reduce the risk between the national policy and the local delivery? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, ever thus, um, you know, we're central government. Um, we have our responsibilities. Local government has its responsibilities and wants to create great places for people to live. And mm. um, we hope that's a symbiotic um, relationship. But, um, you know, we, we have our job to do just as, as much as local government has its has its job to do. And, you know, we hope that we can have good, good dialogue around those topics and that the things that we do in terms of setting a, a national strategy and also hopefully the things that we provide in terms of support um, whether that's through guidance, whether it's access to sampling, whether it's you know, access to British standards, whether it's um, training and development and all of the things that, you know, that we do um, with CTSI as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we hope that, that that means that there is not a disconnect, but there shouldn't be. You know, we're about outcomes. We're about protecting people and places, which, you know, should be a shared outcome with colleagues um, in local government. Great, thank you, Sarah. I think there are there are you probably did a few other additional comments and and, and questions, including uh, some suggestions and considerations for you and OPSS around uh, quite a diverse range of things. So spray on roof insulation uh, as a and product safety issues around that um, in terms of um, uh, similar to the cladding issue, and then also a comment from uh, Nicola Tudor. 
is there any coordination with companies house uh, reform um, there's a lot of unsafe products out there it, uh, just a i guess a a, a, um, a comment yeah. really so so some of that is spoiler alert you know we we're going to have some exciting propositions yeah. in the product safety uh, review consultation um about how 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 we make these things happen about how we see responsibilities shaping up for online marketplaces mm -hmm. um so you know watch this space we've been busy scurrying away in the background and we hope we've got a set of policy proposals that people are going to find you know answer answer the very questions that are before us so great great what watch this space is what i would say <laughs> you you heard it here first so that's great thank you very much sarah there's there's, there's a few more comments but i'm sure we can we can pass those on to you um, in due course. Thank you very much for your time. Th thank you, Duncan. And I hope the rest of the event is, is good. And uh, it'd be great to see colleagues, I'm sure, um, over the coming months um, at different, different things. So thank you Brilliant. and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Sarah. Bye-bye. Now, while we, um, while we readjust, um, so thank you for all your comments. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of them, um, but uh, we're, we're on to another hot button issue now. And, and, and this is our final session today. And it is a real political hot potato as well right now. Uh, housing is very high up the political agenda. Um, it's clear that uh, the reform agenda, including um, the renters reform bill and the the decent home standard will have um, significant implications for the work of trading standards and environmental health and we, we're fortunate to have a trio of speakers um, who can provide us with their thoughts on what change we can expect to drive up standards in, in the year ahead. Uh, kicking us off is David Smith who is partner with JMW Solicitors. Uh, David specialises in residential property litigation uh, and he's former policy director for the Residential Landlords Association and is uh, legal counsel for the National Residential Landlords Estate Association. So, David, very good to see you here, and uh, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Afternoon. I think I'm going to start out with, with some controversy because obviously it makes a, a discussion more interesting. Um, but the reality is I, I don't think that the, the white paper is likely to lead to much change in the coming year, and possibly not at all. Um, I mean, the first thing we should bear in mind is that this, this white paper has been going on or off and on more accurately uh, as the renters reform bill, um, as, a, as the fairer renting white paper. It's been talked about as the renters reform bill again now, um, and, but, but it's been talked about since 2018, 2019, and we still haven't progressed very far. So I don't think we should assume that there's going to be a sudden burst of progress all of a sudden. Um, but the other point about it is, is that, that that progress, even if it comes relatively quickly, won't happen within the coming year. The, the current talk is a, is a bill appearing in the spring of 23. That's not likely to come into effect in any substantial way until well into 2024. Indeed, in the Fair Renting White Paper, the government said they'd give at least six months warning of the bill coming into effect for new tenancies and a year's warning of it coming into effect for existing tenancies. So even if it is zoomed through Parliament by late 2023, that still takes us well into 2024 and 2025 before it starts to, to do much. But then let's look at the actual provisions in it. Are they really going to change things? Um, the one that might be thought most obviously to change the situation would be the introduction of the decent home standard uh, into private sector housing. Uh, it already exists in social housing. But as recent events have shown us, the decent home standard in social housing has not led to social housing being by any stage in the state sense perfect. There are fundamental problems in condition in social housing. Um, and so simply saying we'll have a decent home standard in private sector housing is not going to, to make those fundamental problems go away from social housing and it will, those fundamental problems will still exist in private sector housing as well. Um, the other problem is What's the decent home standard really add above and beyond the existing structure? It's a very low level standard. Um, second, uh, it relies on the HHSRS. One of the sort of elements of the decent home standard is that there can't be any category one HHSRS hazards. So in point of fact, a local authority has to do an HHSRS assessment really 
to be able to do a decent home standard assessment. Um, and if you've already done the HHSRS assessment and found category one hazards, then presumably you would just act on those and wouldn't bother carrying on uh, and doing a decent homes assessment. So it, it sits on top of an existing power that local authorities already have um, to do something about um, about uh, low, low standard and private sector property. So I'm not convinced that adding an, another name to it and adding some more stuff on the back end is going to go a long way to, towards improving what is already there. Um, another big item is um, the property portal. So look, the government keeps calling it a property portal because they don't want to say landlord register, but it's a compulsory property portal that all landlords have to sign their properties up to, and they can be fined by local authorities um, if they um, don't sign up to it. So it, it sounds kind of like a landlord register to me, although, although um, let's, let's, let's give the government the benefit down and say it's a property portal. Um, so it provides more info to, to tenants primarily. The idea is it will it will provide tenants a single viewing point to see whether their property has a gas safety certificate, uh, an HMO or selective license, an EICR or an EPC. But in truth, it's going to be hugely reliant um, on, uh, on, uh, on, on landlords and agents telling the truth. The current proposal is that there will be a box to tick to see it say that the property meets the decent home standard. I find it unlikely that your average landlord is going to upload their property to the property portal and then not tick the decent homes box, thereby displaying their property on the portal for all tenants to see as non-decent. That seems an improbable state of affairs. Um, and of course, so what if there's a property portal? At the moment, the issue is not really that, that properties are substandard. Many tenants are fully aware that the property they're living in is substandard but they're unable to do very much about it because they lack resources, they lack awareness of their options, um, or they simply don't have a choice about where they live. And I think the difficulty here is that the property portal might provide more information to tenants about the property they're about to move into or that they are currently living in, but it's unlikely to tell them something that they don't already know. Um, where it potentially is more helpful to local authorities is by identifying rental properties to them. So it's easier for local authorities to identify rental properties. But the reality is local authorities have got mechanisms to do that. Many local authorities now have selective licensing schemes in place to identify, uh, uh, identify rental properties. And then there are other methods of information gathering you can use to identify rental properties. So simply knowing that properties are rented through the portal doesn't change the reality that you still have to go out there and enforce against them. And as indeed someone's already mentioned in the chat, there's a lack of resources for enforcement. So providing you with a, 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 a list of all the rental properties in an area doesn't necessarily automatically give you the resources to go and enforce against all those rental properties. Uh, and so, and, and in fact, I expect most local authorities know perfectly well where all the rental properties are in their area. Um, the other thing, of course, is that as soon as you put in a property portal, you've got to question whether selective licensing schemes, which are primarily set up by local authorities as information gathering exercises, are actually worthwhile. And there's of course a, a complex subtext to selective licensing schemes in that while local authorities can't make money out of them, the investment they put into setting them up does help pay for the cost and it certainly helps them break free the money from their own internal treasuries to have sufficient environmental health officers to do enforcement activity and so you get you get enforcement benefit in other areas like housing standards um, out of enforcing a selective licensing scheme. Um, if, you, if you have the, the incentive to carry out selective licensing reduced or removed by a property portal, then it's difficult to set up a selective licensing scheme um, and, and, and you lose the sort of additional funding aspect of the selective licensing scheme, whether that's from landlords, as, as landlords always think it is, but actually in, in my experience, it's more usually, usually from internal local authority treasuries um to um to push these things forward so i'm not entirely sure that, that, that the property portal in and of itself um provides an answer and, and of course this is the, the sort of point i'm going to keep making here is that none of the proposals in the fair and parenting white paper in and of themselves are going to improve property standards it's the things that are outside the white paper that i'm concerned about likewise uh, of course the huge um big ticket item in, in the fair renting by paper is getting rid of section 21, uh, what many people will call no fault eviction or no blame eviction, <coughs> um, yeah, th these kind of things. Um, so um, 
it, it'll be harder for landlords to simply evict tenants without giving some justified reason why they're doing so. And of course, tenancies will be periodic from the start. So tenants will be stuck into one year contracts. They'll be able to leave easily. But again, how much does this really alter things? Tenants can leave properties more easily, but they still got to have somewhere to go. And at a time when rents are going through the roof, um, uh, then um, uh, th th there's a there's a real difficulty um, in terms of, um, of of sort of linking these together. There's a real there's a real challenge in terms of uh, of, 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 uh, of tenants leaving and then going somewhere else. Um, and, and in any event, the other problem, of course, is that you get rid of all these things, but will it really affect bad landlords? A bad landlord doesn't actually worry too much about Section 21. Uh, what they actually worry about um, is, um, is, is, more, uh, is more an issue of um, uh, what they actually do if they want to get rid of tenants, sorry, is, is simply uh, throw them out the door. If, and a bad landlord will, will simply behave even more badly and justify it to themselves, of course, that they have to do it. Uh, and so my concern is that um, getting rid of Section 21 is not likely to affect the very worst landlords, the ones we most want to deal with, uh, the ones who also like to sign up to a property portal and are also like to meet the decent home standard or even know what it is. Um, so getting rid of Section 21 does not improve standards in itself. And in fact, it seems to me that one of the biggest problems with standards ultimately, of course, is, is lack of tenant choice. If tenants have a choice about where they lived, then... Um, poorer quality properties would be would be rousted out of the sector by people just not wanting to live in them. And it would be quite easy to get rid of them and landlords would have a choice to either improve them or not rent them out. But we actually have a greater regulatory burden on landlords, which is making some good landlords to let to leave the market. We have interest rate problems, which is causing fewer landlords to buy into the market and also leave, causing other landlords to leave. And then we also have a situation where people are, are now increasingly reluctant to buy houses because interest rates are high and so tenant demand is through the roof and therefore rents are through the roof. So in fact, we're in a position where uh, demand is rising, stock is dropping, um, and those two things together tend to lead us towards the very worst standards. And in some senses, one of the people talk often about the rent act period as being very bad for housing standards. <coughs> um, one of the reasons for that was not just rent control, it was because of the very, very limited options available to someone who wanted to rent. And so we're in danger of putting ourselves back in the same position. So I'm, I'm extremely concerned that all of these things are not going to help. One of the things that did appear to uh, show up in, in the white paper that, that, that seemed hopeful is the idea that, that local authorities would get more, more enforcement power. Now, uh, the trouble with that, of course, is it was thrown as a one-liner without being very clear what further extra enforcement powers were going to come up. There was a talk of increased fines, and, and I can certainly see the government upping the standard £30,000 civil penalty to £40,000, £50,000 or £60,000. Um, that, of course, to some extent might return some funding to local authorities if they issue higher civil penalties, provided they're able to collect the money. But in practice, if you start to look at the statistics, the collection rates of civil penalties are not that great. Um, because, as is often the case, um, once, <laughs> once in a hard-working environment, a health officer has done all the work and issued the penalty and proven it, they then have to hand it off for collection to other departments in the council who are less interested in collecting that money, and so it never really happens. <clears throat> so increasing the fines doesn't make any difference unless the money is actually collected, although undoubtedly it provides some degree of moral force. But again, um, uh, only, only in situations where landlords are paying attention to this stuff. Um, the uh, other problem is that um, it, it, the, other, the other aspect of this is, is that the government has said it's going to have some kind of minimum sentencing power so that, for example, uh, a tribunal can't reduce the level of penalty uh, in an arbitrary fashion. But of course, that's completely unfair. A tribunal assesses the penalty properly and is a court. <laughs> and it's an, and so it has a right to consider the penalty. That is the sensible structure of the uh, of, of the regime. And and um, so having a, a sentencing guideline of some sort won't necessarily stop the tribunal reducing penalties. Um, so 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 there's a there's, there's work to be thought about there. Beyond that, I I don't honestly see the government actually being prepared to offer further enforcement powers to local authorities. Um, the reality is, it's a conservative government. 
it's a government that is not keen on localism. That's a, a ship that has sailed. Um, and the current uh, turn in the Conservative Party is very much against um, uh, localism and local authority power. <clears throat> so I question how much further dev devolution of powers there's going to be to local authorities. And even if there was, what particular power is it that you would give them that would magically make all of these problems go away? Um, the reality, of course, is what's actually required is more funding. But we've already seen the government's response to that. Michael Gove's uh, great excitement after the, the very sad death of, of a child in, 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 up, in, up in the north in uh, a social house was to say that we're going to provide more money for uh, social uh, for housing enforcement. And he offered up 12 million pounds, uh, split seven ways. So two million pounds for, for, some, for several of the largest local authorities in the country. Um, in reality, unless the government is going to offer up a huge amount of money, given it's got to be split some 360 odd ways, if you're going to give every local housing authority in the country a share, um, I just don't see very much money being shaken loose at a time when the government's constantly talking about austerity. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, David. So it's kind of a, I feel a bit somber after that, actually. It's, um, um, it, it, it does seem like there's a, 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 it's a bit bleak in terms of the opportunities here without proper resourcing and um, the money isn't there. So is there an opportunity in the year ahead, I guess, for us to influence and to help shape this legislation? But um, interesting, we can pick that up, I'm sure, in the, in the Q&As. Um, afterwards. I'd now like to introduce um, James Munro. Uh, now, James is uh, a CTSI's vice, vice chair, and he is the lead for the National Trading Standards Estate and Letting Agency team. James, over to you, please, for your reflections. Thank you, Duncan. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, our team is the, the lead enforcement authority for estate agency work in the UK and for lettings legislation in England. It's quite a unique model in local government terms. Um, we're hosted by two local authorities. And we've got a number of statutory roles in the property sector, the principle of which for today's event is about providing guidance and support for local authorities in their work. So this afternoon, we're talking about the Rents Reform Bill, which obviously is applicable to just England. Um, I'm told the bill is going to become um, legislation next year. Uh, whether or not that actually happens remains to be seen, uh, as David said. There, in terms of setting the scene, there are about 4.4 million households privately renting across England, and the estimates uh, are around about 21% of those are of an unacceptable standard. And as David has just said, the, the bill aims to extend the decent home standard, um, which has been in place in the social housing sector since the early 2000s, to the private rent sector for the first time. Um, the, there's also the proposal that fixed term tenancies will, uh, will go. They will change to periodic tenancies, uh, as has been the case in Scotland for the last five years. Uh, Section 21 will, will be outlawed. There will be some exceptions uh, and landlords will be able to still evict tenants who aren't paying the rent or are engaging in antisocial behaviour. There are proposals for the uh, a new private renters ombudsman to deal with disputes between private renters and landlords without having to go to court. Um, and the bill also seeks to provide to make it illegal for landlords or letting agents to have blanket bans on renting properties to tenants with children or those on benefits, so the old uh, no DSS scenario. And also, uh, as David has also said, is on the horizon is this new property portal that will provide um, the single front door, if you like, to help landlords understand and comply with their responsibility, as well as giving local authorities um, and also tenants the information to, um, to try to help tackle um, rogue landlords and agents. So, what does this mean for local authorities? Well, a lot of the legislation that's coming out of the Department for Leveling Up Housing Communities in recent years has given enforcement duties to trading standards and housing authorities jointly. Um, so the Tenant Fees Act and the Leasehold Reform Grand Rent Act are two of the 
major pieces of legislation that have come out in the last few years. And it's anticipated that the same enforcement duties and powers will apply uh, in the Renters for Reform Bill. So we all really need to modernise our approach to regulation. We've heard earlier on from, from people that talking about the, the different the different approach that's needed for regulation and the future uh, i think is very much about collaboration uh, i started off my career working in well, what is in hindsight a very silo based team uh, which gradually grew in in its influence by creating partnership working arrangements and our national team today is made up of trading standards, environmental health, housing and licensing officers, lawyers, police officers and financial investigators. And our officers are also multi-skilled in, in the soft skills like coaching, mentoring and mental health support. And we couldn't do what we do without that range of specialisms and knowledge and backgrounds. And we ensure that our officers are qualified and competent to do the work as a starting point. So the team works well, theoretically, in any in 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 that sense, in in a, in a joined up regulatory environment in the property sector. So we've got consumer advice um, dealt with by citizens' advice. We've got statutory redress dealt with by the the property redress scheme and the, the property ombudsman. We provide support for um, businesses, um, and we also provide the the support for local authorities, and we also can carry out enforcement. Um, right the way up to banning orders for the most serious cases. And our team acts really as a backstop for local authorities on the enforcement side so that we can step in if necessary or required. And we're also able to investigate general issues affecting the private rented sector, such as the activities of sourcing agents uh, and the, um, the problem with referral fees, which are hidden, very often not disclosed, and things like alternative deposit schemes, which are really starting to get a lot of traction these days with the cost of living crisis um, and people being unable to afford the large deposits that are being asked um, asked for, as well as the, the increased rents that, are, that we're seeing at the moment. It's interesting seeing uh, or hearing what um, Professor Hodges was saying earlier on about, about cooperative regulation, because a lot of our what our team does is aimed at improving outcomes rather than creating outputs. So examples of this include our work to improve the amount of upfront information in property listings for buyers and for tenants. Now this, rather than relying on, on the threat of, of um, some regulatory sanction, involved bringing together um, a whole range of organisations, the CMA, government, conveyancing bodies, professional bodies, industry representatives, redress schemes and the major property portals which was which was really challenging however it's been really successful and we're now seeing much greater disclosure of um, certainly to start with non-optional financial information including the tenure of properties for those looking to buy a property but also um, resolving issues around the way that rent uh, is is being asked for up front and, and being displayed in property listings and these these changes really help prospective buyers and tenants to make these informed decisions about the property that they want to rent or buy. We're also working with the redress schemes and client money protection schemes to provide a single point of inquiry for enforcement officers to check local compliance with these requirements, uh, rather than having to navigate what would be eight different websites. Um, and this facility will soon be able to enable officers to, to map the number of property agents in their local authority area, which is going to be uh, a real benefit, we think. And then this, the hope is that this will expand to other compliance areas, for example, anti-money laundering regulations, and will eventually translate into the ability to display this compliance information in real time on websites and property portals and other advertisements. So, in terms of specific challenges for local authorities, well, moving from fixed term tenancies to periodic tenancies um, probably has implications for things like the student let, let sector. Uh, so, local authorities with student accommodation will need some clarity on how those, those agreements will be affected. Uh, the introduction of the decent home standards, as David has said, is going to bring new complexities to what is 
really quite a, 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 an already piecemeal housing enforcement scene. The HHSRS is, is also being reviewed and this is proposed to be one of the criteria for the, dis, the, the new decent home standard. Local authorities will almost certainly have additional inspection enforcement burdens under this new regime. The property portal, and while the detail is yet to be published specifically on how this is going to work, will provide a range of information for local authorities. But are local authorities expected to trust the information on the portal if it's landlords self-certifying compliance? Or will tradespeople or authorised personnel be able to verify certificates and checks and property safety for, re for renters? Will there be issues with fraudulent or road traders taking advantage of this new system and also taking advantage of uninformed landlords? Talking of landlords, there are around two and a half million landlords in the UK, and that's probably around two and a half, about around two million in England. With the introduction of landlord redress, the statutory framework has got to be really carefully drafted to, to prevent any overlap with the existing redress providers for estate and letting agents. Because we've also got the new homes ombudsman and the housing ombudsman in the social housing sector. So people need to know where to go when they've got a problem. Compulsory landlord redress is, is going to create a de facto register of landlords. And how will local authorities get access to this data? Who will monitor the trends and deal with referrals from this new ombudsman? Currently, all district authorities have, have a duty to enforce um, breaches of the redress membership requirements for letting agents. But if local authorities are also expected to enforce relevant breaches or non-compliance outside of just membership requirements, there needs to be a clear referral and case management process between authorities and this new ombudsman so that the, the, the consumer journey is not affected. We all know that if people make a complaint, if that complaint isn't dealt with or at least addressed by the, the organisation they contact, then they will tend to give up. One of the questions for you all this afternoon is, is around landlords and um, are landlords businesses? And I'd like to hear the views of the audience on this. It's a really important question and the definition is going to affect the enforcement and compliance in this sector. We're already in discussions with government about how any new enforcement investigatory powers can be drafted to ensure that they're effective for local authorities. Information and intelligence sharing between local authorities is really key to raising standards in the private rented sector. And a lack of collaboration at the moment is affecting the outcomes that, we, that are required by legislation, which are founded on the first breach, second breach principles, for example, under the Tenant Fees Act. Our team is already working with local trading standards and housing authorities around the country to help officers get to grips with the National Intelligence Database, for example, which has recently been made available to local housing officers ensuring a clear flow of intelligence between the two disciplines, which has been really lacking in the past. This is a key part of our role. And we have just been awarded a grant as part of the Regulators Pioneer Fund, which Chris Hodges referred to earlier, to help expand this work over the next couple of years. So our team is there. It's there to help and support local authorities and, and their officers around the country. So I would encourage anyone to please get in touch and see what we can do to help and I'll put a link to our website in the chat so that you can get in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much there, James. There's a lot of a lot of um, information there, actually, and it's, it's interesting that, that uh, some similar concerns to, to David, in, in particular in relation to the, the uh, property portal. See, see, interesting also to hear about the impact of your partnership approach uh, to resolving rental issues as well. Um, just just while while we're on, um, we we can do a poll actually on what you just suggested. What was it? Was it a our landlords' businesses? Is that a, is that the, the the polling question? We I'm sure we can do a quick poll of folk here on that issue and and see what their views are. Is is that is that the question? Oh, sorry, you can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Duncan. I yeah, I can hear you now. <laughs> That's okay. You now. That's all right. Um, yes, that is the question. What do are, people think? What do people think? Are landlords businesses? 
I'm sure our team will rustle one of those polls up right now. Very good in real time. Um, great. Okay, we'll feedback the results of that very shortly. Um, James, thank you very much. I'm just going to move on now to our final speaker before we open up to Q and A's and comments. Um, our, our final speaker on this session is Dan Wilson Craw, uh, who is Deputy Director at Generation Rent. Um, so hello, welcome, Dan. Hi. Um, you joined uh, Generation Rent in, in 2014, and uh, you've worked on uh, public affairs for, 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 for many years, covering housing, healthcare, and energy. And um, you, since then, you've, you've worked on a number of campaigns, including uh, campaigns to ban letting agents fees and end unfair evictions. So really interested to, to hear your take on on um, Rent is a Reform Bill and the wider housing agenda. So over to you, Dan. Great, thanks very much, Duncan. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'll, I, I won't uh, rehearse the, uh, um, the, the the contents of the uh, Rental Reform White Paper um, as, as David and James have uh, already been through that, but I'll, I'll share some reflections um, of, from our perspective as a as a tenants tenants organisation, um, as uh, Duncan alluded to, we have this uh, this package of reforms for a number of years. Um, obviously, we've got uh, another another bit of time to wait till we can actually get the bill, um, but uh, but we're we're keeping uh, keeping optimistic as as you have to in this in this game. Um, so. Yeah, I'll I'll run through some of the issues that we see, uh, uh, some of some of the impacts we'll see, and, and some of the issues with the with the proposals the government has uh, come out with. Um, firstly, with Section Twenty One and the abolition of Section Twenty One, um, one of the things from our perspective, uh, and and in relation to the quality of homes and and local government um, interest in this. Uh, Section 21, the threat of a landlord evicting you, serving you an eviction notice without needing a reason, is what a really damaging law that um, uh, that, that results in renters being discouraged from complaining. Um, we actually had a poll a few years ago from Citizens Advice uh, that found that 46, uh, that the renters who complained had a 46% chance of being issued with Section 21. Um, in the following uh, six months after their complaint, so that's, that's sort of the scale of, of the problem we're we're facing, and, and people don't don't complain because of that. Um, despite uh, legislation in 2015 that protects tenants from a Section 21 eviction, if their la uh, if their landlord has been served with a an improvement notice by the council. Uh, so councils have this power to protect tenants, in, in environmental health officers. Um, but our own uh, generation rents own research, looking at uh, getting freedom of information, freedom of information data from councils, find, found that three councils find three times as many hazards as they actually serve improvement notices. So, for every improvement notice they serve to protect a tenant, um, there are there are two other on on average two other uh, cases that don't actually get that that level of protection so so that's a big concern that's one reason why we just need to take that protection out of the council's hands and abolish section 20 enti section 21 entirely um obviously the government is going to introduce extra grounds for legitimate reasons for eviction as well uh, which we we need to make sure will work properly and will give tenants um the protection they need and make sure that landlords cannot abuse those those grounds. Um, one other thing that we're, we're a bit worried about is councils um, being unclear about when they can serve an improvement notice in order to protect a tenant from eviction. Um, so, uh, so that's that's something that we need to make sure that the councils are are aware of the of the guidance um, until until bill is actually made law. So, requiring legitimate grounds for eviction. Um, will will come as part of the abolition of Section 21. Uh, tenants will also be able to use the uh, first tier tribunal to challenge rent increases, which is another um, way that that that, count, that landlords 
can discourage tenants from from raising concerns. Uh, the the tribunal is quite helpful in that if a if a property is in poor condition, um, the tenant can get a discount on the rent if if the if the landlord is trying to raise it. Um, so without the threat of a no fault eviction, those those sorts of cases might be more um, more likely to to proceed and tenants getting protection from that that way. Um, so we th we think with with various safeguards, ab abolition of section twenty one will encourage tenants to come forward with complaints. Um, and you know, in a lot of cases, landlords landlords would do the work anyway. It's just that tenants just don't have the trust in the la that the landlord will do something. Um, it can be really difficult to place your trust in a landlord if you know that they could turn around and serve Section 21 and, and they've got no, uh, they don't need a justification for that. Um, the the other, uh, what the next point point of interest in the white paper is the property portal, um, which which is a, it is a landlord register. Um, I think one of the big benefits of this will be to help councils streamline enforcement. Uh, we've been told by some councils that um, one of the biggest barriers to actually taking adequate enforcement action is knowing exactly who owns the property and who to serve a notice on. So having um, having clear um, responsibility for a property through the, through the portal um, should should help that and should streamline that whole process. Um, I think one of the um, uh, one of the things that will be essential if the property portal is going to work is to make sure that um, that landlords do register. Um, there's there's no point in having it if if landlords can can opt out of it. Um, uh, even if it's and even if it's a criminal offence to opt out of it, um, someone needs to enforce that. Um, there's a big there, there is a um, a line in the white paper that says local councils will be able to take enforcement action against private landlords that fail to join the portal, uh, which obviously is, is, you know, what we should expect. One question is who, which part of the council actually does that enforcement? Because um, obviously we have trading standards already um, that have uh, enforcement responsibilities around letting agents being part of redress schemes, but then at the same time, environmental health PRS teams have responsibility around licensing of landlords so there's a sort of question about who who would have that responsibility um i think for us what's more important is that um councils don't have sole responsibility or sole um power over enforcement uh, of 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 compliance with the portal um especially because as we've covered already councils don't have very much resource um, just another thing to to enforce will will cause problems um, invariably. So one thing we I think one thing that's important to recognise um, is that the people best placed to identify an unregistered landlord are their tenants. Um, and already we have a system where if if a landlord requires a license and doesn't have one, um, their tenant can apply for a rent repayment order of 12 months rent, um, up to 10, 12 months rent. Um, and uh, and that's a good incentive for the tenant to to check if their landlord is compliant with licensing. Um, and then, then they can take action themselves. Um, and that's um, potentially going to be much more um, potent uh, when, when there's a a universal requirement on landlords to be to be registered. Um, so at the moment, seven percent of rental properties have a license, um, but uh, that means it's it's unlikely that a given tenant's home um, will actually require a license. And so there's very little awareness of this um, and, and of renters' rights in in those situations. But once a hundred percent of properties do need to be registered. Um, and assuming that there is a, a reward like a rent re repayment order, if your landlord is breaking the rules, um, then that's that's a good set of conditions for high awareness among the renter population of of the requirements on land, on land, landlords. And then, you know, 
that that's one way of kind of delivering more wider rights information to the tenants but then also landlords knowing that their tenant is likely to know about the property portal they're going to be much more um they're going to have face a lot more pressure to actually get themselves registered and it's going to be harder for for um, the dodgier landlords to evade detection um and then the final section i was going to touch on was just around um, the ombudsman and um and standards <clears throat> um so it, it it's really hard to understand it's hard for us to understand how exactly the ombudsman will um operate when the government's saying that if the if a home fails decent home standards the tenant will be able to um, apply for compensation through the ombudsman um you know we know that there's um there are existing channels through local authorities and through the first tier tribunal for tenants to um to seek um to seek redress uh, we also obviously have the property ombudsman um covering blessing agents um what we don't really know is how much each of these channels is used um we do know for example that um around there's been around 35 tribunal decisions uh, around the tenant fees act um, but we don't know how many cases um the property ombudsman and redress scheme deal with around the tenant fees act we don't really know how many um cases the trading standards um trading standards officers um do so um so getting a, getting an idea of that will might maybe help us understand exactly what an ombudsman's impact on the um, on wider private rent sector will will have. Um, I think one one benefit from the ombudsman would be that the people who are using it are going to be those people who are more maybe more likely to understand their rights, advocate for themselves, uh, confident about seeking uh, redress, but they can't currently support. Uh, afford legal support which might allow them to take their landlord to court which um is usually yeah either very expensive or only available to people who are who qualify for legal aid so that by taking maybe the more kind of articulate um private renters out of the um uh local authorities might not necessarily deal with with those renters as much it would allow them to focus their resources on um households who are, le who are less able to advocate for themselves um <clears throat> so you know that might you know we could we would see maybe more selective licensing schemes targeting poor areas of of, this, of a city um to 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 make sure that the the most vulnerable tenants are um are adequately protected from from um, the worst landlords um I think with the ombudsman, one of the big questions is who, how many, how how much in the way of skills are they going to have um, to uh, to go out and do inspections? Who is going to do the inspections? Who's going to objectively assess whether a property is failing the decent home standard? Um, you know, at the moment, the property ombudsman doesn't do this for um, uh, for letting agents. It doesn't deal with quality issues um the housing ombudsman is dealing with regulated social landlords so it's really hard to know um you know how, how that's going to work in a in a private rent sector with a lot of individual landlords who you know wouldn't consider themselves to be professionals so that's that's one thing to to, to bear in mind um and then just quickly on uh, on what powers are needed um there's definitely uh, concerns around how um, how landlords are structured. Like there's a lot of rent to rent schemes that are, that pop up in various cities where it's very it's not clear to the tenant who who actually owns the property, who's responsible for the property. Um, it needs to be we need to be very clear in the in the legislation that um, you know and anyone who's owning the property and dealing with the tenants are you know they're all accountable in some way. Um, we also need to make sure that uh, councils have adequate powers of investigation. Um, I think there are, there are some areas where the 2004 legislation doesn't give give councils enough enough in the way powers um, to, to take on 
landlords and then in particular around illegal eviction which is likely to become more of an issue once landlords cannot use section 21 more landlords might um, just try and evade the whole legal process entirely so so those those are some some of the powers that i think are will be needed for for local authorities to um to to, to make this package of legislation as effective as possible thanks Great. Thank you very much for that, Dan. That was a really good overview. And absolutely, how do we protect the most vulnerable tenants from landlords um, enforcement? Who will do the enforcement within a local authority and, and kind of what powers, what additional powers are needed to take on some of these landlords? So um, I'm going to invite questions from uh, people. Um, but before we do that, I will reveal the poll results. Um, you will be... Uh, surprised to you might not be surprised to know uh, that around um 95 percent of people believe that landlords are a business um and but there was some qualifying uh, so i think there was a comment if if they have just one house is it really a business so any any thoughts any observations on on that poll result while we wait for well, questions i don't think the courts would agree with you <laughs> Uh, and, and indeed, the CMA doesn't agree with you either. And the CMA is said in relation to consumer protection and fair trading regulations that individual landlords are probably not traders. And, we don't. And we don't always. We don't, we don't always agree with the CMA, dude. Well, absolutely. <laughs> but but, um, but it's not really relevant. What any of us think. The only arbiter of this is the courts, and it, it, as a rule, they've tended to be landlords as consumers. Um, I think I think the point is here. It's just making sure that any legislation that involves sanctions against um, against landlords doesn't use any the generic term businesses, and rather uses the word the, the term landlord and then defines what that term says. And that's what we're trying to get. Um, that's what we're trying to work with government to get them to do. But, but, I, but I'm not sure it, it takes you forward. I mean, I've seen a lot of people in the chat talk about consumer protection from unfair trading regulations and the requirement of professional diligence, but you're only reading half the regulation. If you mention that, the rest of it says it has to materially distort the decision-making practice of a consumer. Um, and I think the challenge in a lot of these cases is you're, you're going to have difficulty showing the criminal standard that that someone's decision-making act that was, was, was altered by a, a landlord's uh, lack of professional diligence. And the, the difficulty is that you're, you're going to have to show the landlord lied about something. And often they don't. They just don't talk about it at all. So if a landlord explicitly lies about being on the portal or having a license, that's one thing. If a landlord isn't required to have a license, so they don't, or they don't get asked about it, that's a, a totally different discussion. This, why these prosecutions rarely succeed and why there have been so few prosecutions that have been effective against letting agents. Anyone want to come back on what David said there? Um, I think not treat it. I think treating landlords as consumers is possibly one of the reasons why uh, the, uh, the private rental sector has such a bad reputation. Um, you know, letting, letting people who are providing service in exchange for about, you know, a third of people's income you know that's a huge responsibility and for that reason landlords should be considered businesses Leg you know you, i don't fully i don't i don't, I don't fully uh, appreciate the legal implications of that of course you have argued for them being treated as consumers in a different context the reason the government treats landlords as consumers is so they can tax them differently from businesses and not as traders and that's something you yourself have advocated for if you if you want you can't have, you can't have, have it both ways if landlords are trading businesses then landlords are also entitled to the same tax deductions as trading businesses, which means that they would have to get tax deduction against mortgage interest payments, for example. So, so one of the reasons the government chooses not to call them traders is it wants to tax, wants to tax them as consumers. And the difficulty is that, that at the current time, people want to have it both ways. You can't. Let's yeah, start I think we're, we're my going <laughs> slightly off topic, really. I think yes, the point yes. is that we need we need clarification from the government that if the, if if enforcement action is going to be contemplated against landlords, then there needs to be that needs to be defined in the legislation so that we don't have this argument about whether they are businesses or not. 
Thank you, James, for stepping in there. Yes, I think we've probably provoked a lot of debate and, and, and discussion this, but uh, we, we can move on to, to some questions. I can't see any particular questions in the, the chat. There's a lot of comments. Um, just wanted to, I mean, any reflections on the, I mean, obviously we've got trading standards and environmental health largely on the audience here. Um, any any comments on which part of the council does this work? Does the enforcement action where it should sit working well, together? I think I think the intention by government is that the 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 powers and duties will sit with both um, housing and uh, trading standards, with the intention then that either or can uh, or could take action. And as I say, we're we're certainly advocating much more joined up collaborative working, so that so that it's so that each are aware of their their own um, what what they can bring to play. And, and and the key thing here really is about what other agencies can bring to play to in a particular investigation so for example with trading standards um coming in they could they can bring their knowledge of the cprs the consumer protection regulations uh into any any investigation which which can help housing teams you know with the, with their with their work and vice versa any comments on that from anyone no? I think just yeah, I mean, just to re 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 reiterate my point um, earlier about um, just on kind of um, the idea that I, I think it's quite it might it might be quite common. I, I hope that I hope that it's it's uh, it, it's it's not as common to to have siloed kind of um, uh, departments who who are you know both interested in in the property sector, um, and yeah, clearly there's. You know, so, some some groups will have knowledge of of sort of bad actors in um, in local areas, and it's yeah, I think it's it's um, it'd be good to for for us as uh, you know people who are representing the consumers in this uh, situation, at least some of the consumers, David, um, the uh, to 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 understand sort of how much work is being done on um, you know, but by by trading standards and by um, uh, by EHOs as well. Okay, thank thank you, Daphne. We do have some questions. So, um, first first one, I'll, I'll point to to you, David. Are are you only thinking of environmental health legislation in what you were talking about? What about collaborative working with trading standards? There was a lot of knowledge and expertise between these two areas. Yeah, I mean, as, as I've already, we've already canvassed, uh, how much tra can trading standards impact on individual landlords and how much can they impact on letting agencies? I think in, in practice, trading standards are right to focus their attention on letting agencies. Letting agencies are, are, are badness multipliers. A bad letting agency attracts bad landlords and makes them worse. Um, and, and they should be rooted out aggressively. Okay, thank you. Um, and a question for uh, James is it's a, it's a comment. Could we look at multidisciplinary training workshops on regulating the property sector? Yes, we, we most definitely can. And and we are. And if you get in touch with us, we're, we can certainly uh, come over to come and help you. That's absolutely what we're about for the next, um, you know, for the foreseeable future. That's what we want to try to do. Okay, thank you for that, James. Uh, there's a question from Virginia. Uh, does lack of insulation come into the decent home standard? Where where does that fit? Um, any any um, input on that? It can do in that one of the requirements of the decent home standard is that a property has sufficient thermal insulation or th thermal pat properties, but that. Again, the problem here is that the decent home standard is so low level that that it's really aimed more at properties that don't have any heating at all. And and and, and uh, I mean, the level of thermal insulation required to meet the standard is is really low brow. There's also the minimum energy efficiency standards, um, which are separate. I think most mostly separate is it from from what was in the consultation for applying decent home standard to the private rental sector uh it seemed to sort of 
try to make sure there wasn't overlap with with what's the what these MES standards are, um, uh, which which do cover in, insulation um, through the EPC certificate, uh, yeah, energy performance certificate. Yeah, I think the government missed a trick. Really, the, the government did say in the decent home standard um, consultation that 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 uh, minimum thermal standards weren't necessarily the same thing as MES, but it means crazy to me that you wouldn't just make it the same thing as me actually yeah if, if you're going to have a minimum energy efficiency standard then if someone hasn't met that then how can they possibly have met a decent home standard it just doesn't make make any sense to me that you would that you would say oh your property could be decent but still be unlawful because it's not meeting the minimum energy efficiency standards it's a, a very odd approach and, and symptomatic in a sense of the total disconnection between different departments. I mean, the reason, of course, they've done it is that the minimum energy efficiency standards are a different department and therefore we can't talk to each other. I just wanted to make a um, thank you for that. I just wanted to make a, a, a kind of get each of your views really on there's There's a lot here about um, it seems like there's a lot of rhetoric about um, the, the the legislation, but there's not a lot of substantial change that you know, David you, you you suggested will will result. Um, what's the one thing that we could do as a profession, as as environmental health as trading standards, to lobby for improvements in the existing legislation or the the, the proposed legislation? What's the one thing that that would make the biggest impact? Who wants um, to go first? If, if it's me, you're asking if it's, I mean, the, the real thing I think we need is more houses so people have more choice, but for environmental health professionals, you, it's money, resources. I mean, there's a crashing shortage of resources. I'm sure I don't need to tell anybody out here today that there's a national shortage of EHOs. There's a national shortage of, of professionals in, in, in regulation areas, in, in the trading standards, actually, in local authorities. And there's a massive shortage of money because and did I saw something today? There's been five housing ministers this year. This year, hmm. there's, people just aren't taking this seriously in central government. Until until people actually want to take housing actually seriously, seriously enough to make it a ministerial job you actually keep, and I, I don't see how this is going to change. Uh, James, what about yourself? Well, I think it's. Um, I'm, I'm going to put that back to you, Duncan, because I think it's it's up to the professional bodies. I think it's up to CIEH and CTSI. Um, to take that message to government because yeah. um, I think it's you know they're, they're the the people who advocate on our behalf. There's a there's a comment from Emma uh, Cook. Um, one thing to do: collaborate, improve collaboration and communication um, on the enforcement landscape. So that sounds like a, a a positive step that we could do together as as both professional professional bodies. Um, Dan, any 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 thoughts from you on that, what the one thing that we could do as a profession? I, um, I think big the big one is to make sure the portal is effective and that requires tenants engaging with it and and mm -hmm. giving tenants good reasons to engage with that, um, and then that will make that'll make the job of councils much easier and uh, and then yeah ultimately make life harder for the for the worst landlords. Great, thank you for that. Um, Got find a good couple of comments about intelligence sharing. I don't know if there's any comments that you want to make on intelligence sharing and how we can improve that. Um, well, we are trying to to improve that. We've uh, trading standards authorities uh, around the country have used uh, national intelligence databases for several years now. Um, housing colleagues haven't had access to that database until now. So we are the the government's actually funded some licenses for housing authorities to get access to that, and we're going around the country as we speak, um, speaking to housing teams and regions to try to encourage that collaboration and get the local officers on board. And it's really really important when you look at the, especially when I refer to the first breach, second breach protocols, because if if um, for example a letting agent has already committed a first breach somewhere else. Um, then it's really important that if there is a second bit breach, then that is picked up because uh, it may be picked up by a different authority or indeed a different officer. Great. Thank you for that, James. 
Um, I'm just aware of time. Um, I think we've run over a little bit, but that's been a really interesting discussion. And uh, clearly uh, the polls provoked quite a lot of interest as well. So I'd like to thank you, uh, David, James and Dan for your time this afternoon. Um, I'm sure we can carry on the, the discussion, certainly between uh, CTSI and CIH on, on what more we can do to, to, to lobby and influence for, for the changes that we want as a profession. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and now it's time for me to wrap up, I think. So um, um, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today um, for, um, for today's session. Um, and we have a, join us again tomorrow for uh, the year ahead day two. We've got some great, great speakers kicking off with um, Emily Miles from the Food Standards Agency uh, tomorrow morning. Um, I'd like to thank our um, sponsors, Civica and the Credit Services Association, um, and to all of our speakers today um, for a great start to the year ahead and um, see you tomorrow. And we would very much welcome feedback. Uh, uh, there will be a survey, a link will be sent around to you. Um, and once you've completed that survey, we will send you your CPD certificate. So thank you very much and we'll See you tomorrow.